प्रीतुपर्णा 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 हेलो हाँ बताइए ये रिकॉर्डिंग अभी से शुरू कर दी बंद कर दी या So I request the attention of all the respected faculties and delegates. Kindly allow me a few minutes of yours, and let me introduce myself and introduce the faculty members of this session. A very good morning and welcome to one and all. I am Ritu Parna from Clarinet, the designated session assistant for a seamless experience. And Clarinet is India's most trusted and widely used strategic platform with multiple enriching services exclusively for the doctors. Clarinet is very proud to be the digital partner for this webinar named Brand Symposium. Where we are going to have an interactive and insightful session with lots of case presentations and discussion by the experts on the sensational topics. Firstly, RH iso immunization and GI disorders in pregnancy, organized by Association of Fellows Gynecologists, Mumbai. Now, without wasting any further minute, let's begin today's session. For which I would like to invite none other than Dr. Manohar Muthwani, the honorary and HOD at Rajawadi Hospital. Sir is also the honorable secretary of Softsi Maharashtra chapter and has been the past president of AFG. It's an immense pleasure to have you, sir, over here. Now the stage is all yours. Over to you, sir. Please proceed. A good morning, friends. Welcome to Rand Symposia. We are on a new platform today. We are joined with Clarinet. And before I start with uh, my talk, I would like to thank uh, Clarinet because you know almost for the last three weeks we've been associated with them and they've done a swell job. Absolutely professional. A special thanks to Ambika because she was in touch with the entire faculty all throughout uh, the last three, three and a half weeks. And they have been excellent in their method of putting in the brochure and the uh, WhatsApp uh, messages and the mails we have sent all across the country. So I think a very, very special thanks. This is almost like a single solo show by Ambika. Thank you, Ambika, and thank you, Clarinet. I, as the time passes, I think we have seen you across other symposia also, and you've been excellent in most of the symposia we have attended. Of course, I don't attend so very many as they are, but whatever I've seen through Clarinet have been excellently conducted. Well, coming back to where we are, I won't take more than three minutes of your talk time when we are with RAN. Now, the people who have joined a little late on this platform, the other platform, Onference, and the other platforms in you. We are a group of, uh, in fact, we belong to an association known as AFG, Association of Fellow Gynecologists. And uh, the person who's uh, through whom this name has been coined is with us, Dr. Anam Sarogi, sir. He's with us and he is his entire thing started over a cup of tea somewhere. AFG came into existence and we've been with, with them for the last 18, 20 years now. Ran the germ of an idea was uh, started uh, by two prominent people, Dr. Mohan Gadam, who's not able to join today because of his prior commitments, and Dr. Sarabhi. They were both affiliated to RN Cooper Hospital and they felt that when they interacted with students across the teaching institute, they realized that there is some amount of... Uh, knowledge is not being parted down or perhaps they felt the teaching wasn't enough. So with so much of experience behind them of years and years, they felt let's pass it on to the next generation. And well, it started there. Following that, uh, we had um, Dr. Karthik joined in, then Dr. Rajkumar and myself. So we are, the, we are perhaps not the big five, but we can call it the five who have been with RAND for a long time. There's already more than 10 years now. And we were into physical forms and the, the the way the word has been coined is RN stands for RN Cooper Hospital and the A is the AFG Center. Initially, it was Nanavati, the N was because we did some some programs at Nanavati Hospital, Mumbai. All, the, all of this belongs to Mumbai. So it all started and we've been uh, physically for a long time, then COVID and then platform. We find this platform very convenient for all of us, even the faculty and the students, and we can reach across a wide audience. Well, to be specific, RAND belongs to students. This entire concept has been student directed. We want the students to take whatever the seniors have. So we invite experts from right across uh, perhaps the country. And today we have two experts with us, Dr. Purnima Satoskar and Dr. Sanjeev Khanna. So that's how the program comes into play by discussing what the students want. We sit together and this entire program is going. So in short, we are in to stay. Let's see how long we continue. We are very happy with our new so-called marriage with Clarinet. Let's hope it lasts long and over to Dr. Sarogi to continue the proceedings. Please welcome in for a great time. We'll be here with you for the next three, three and a half hours. Two topics, RH, aloe immunization, 
and GI disorders in pregnancy. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Manohar. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, friends. I'm going to talk for about two to three minutes about history of RH isoimmunization, how it all started. I don't think many of you are aware of it. In 1939, a new blood group called Rhesus was discovered by Philip Levine and Stein. In 1940, Carl Landsteiner and Alexander Weiner from Rockefeller Institute in New York, USA found that when rabbits were injected with the blood of rhesus monkey, antibodies were produced. These antibodies were referred to as rhesus. In 1943, American investigator Dr. A.S. Weiner had developed three antisera and had defined six alleles. That means C, D, E, and capital C, capital D, capital E. However, <clears throat> the Ronald Fresher, a British gynecologist, studied the work of RR race with four antisera and he propounded that antigen and genes recognized by these two antibodies were LA. Fisher named them C and C. The other two antisera were called D and E. The work of Bevis in 1950 introduced the clinical possibility of diagnosing hemolytic disease in the fetus by analyzing blood pigments in the amniotic fluid. Babies used spectrophotometric scanning of amniotic fluid and focused on increased absorbance of bilirubin at 450 microgram, microns. This work was later used as basis for Lilly's graph charting. What is more important, we all know that phototherapy is one of the treatment of jaundice in newborn. A very interesting observation by Sister J. Ward, the nurse in charge of the premature unit at Rockford General Hospital, Essex, England, led to the concept of phototherapy for jaundice baby. She was a keen fresh air fan and warm summer day, she would wheel the whole delicate babies out into the courtyard, sincerely convinced that fresh air and warm sunshine would be beneficial for their frail health. Once warm summer day in 1956, Sister Ward showed the physician Dr. Dobbs and Dr. Creamer a premature baby who were pale yellow except for a strongly demarcated triangle of skin very much yellowish than the rest of the baby. That was because that part was covered with a gauze piece. These two, this incident stimulated R. H. Dobbs and R. H. Creamer to look for more carefully into the action of sunlight on bilirubin. In 1957, Clare, Bechte, and Brown introduced a procedure for detecting fetal hemoglobin cells. This test is called as acid elution test by Clare. Lilly in 1963 was first to perform a successful fetal intrauterine transfusion intraperitoneally. The prevention of RH isoimmunization in pregnancy by administration of gamma globulin, that means NTD, owes its concept and research to Vincent Frieda, an obstetrician, and John Corman, a pathologist. Sorry to interrupt you, sir, but yeah. the slides are not moving. No, no, I'm the... not, it's not with the slide. I'm just talking. The Please. slide will start after some time. Sure, sir. Sorry. In 61, Finn, Clark, Donne, McNall, and co workers suggested that RH isoimmunization could be prevented by injecting RH negative women with NTD plasma during immediate postpartum period. That is how the concept of NTD postpartum started. Bowman in 1978 forwarded strong evidence that 1% RH negative women produce RH antibodies during pregnancy. This means that 1% RS negative women undergo antenatal sensitization, thus prompting the need for prophylactic antenatal therapy. And since 1995, trials of monoclonal antibody were obtained and it has started in a routine way. Thank you. With this, I hand over the mic to Dr. Bhagyashri to start with her case. Yes, sir, sir, just a minute before I go. Yeah. One thing yeah. which I was very interesting, a friend of mine told me, uh, he has seen his uh, late 90s had done this study on RH, perhaps it was his thesis or something. Uh -huh. His name is Dr. Jesse Levy, one of my good friends. He came yeah. in with a beautiful, interesting story regarding RH. You know, the concept of alloimmunization or isoimmunization was started somewhere much in the middle of the 1800s. 
there was a okay. prison in US by the name of Sing Sing Prison, S I N G S I N G. And mm. this was about 30, 40 kilometers from the Hudson River. And they had these inmates who were imprisoned there. There were about 1,700 inmates. What the people thought was they used to inject these inmates with uh, positive blood. And then they used to collect their blood. And uh, then they found that's how this the entire concept of antibodies and all came into. So all this was studied in the 1900s and the ox and the rabbit experiments which gave to the concept of giving entity. Now one beautiful answer I'd like to give before starting the presentation, or should I keep it for a little later? Why is it 72 hours post-delivery? I think we'll take the question with the student. So on to Bhageshri. Bhageshri, let me tell you one thing. We are very, very soft-hearted people. Dr. Purnima is an excellent teacher. I'm telling you, it'll be a treat for you to, uh, to interact with her primarily. We'll be, of course, there are subsidiaries. But please yes. relax and I tell you it'll be fun. And for all oh, the students yes. out there, you're in for a great morning. So pick up your teas and coffees next to you and join us, please. Over to you, Bhagdishri. Yes. So can you hear me? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, good morning, respected seniors and colleagues. I'm Dr. Bhagdishri Karke, secondary DNB student from Bhava Hospital, Bandra. And I will be presenting case on RH ISO immunization. 24 years old, Mrs. X. Homemaker, Hindu, uh, educated till 12th standard. Bhageshri, uh, go on this. Bhageshri, go on the slideshow, please. I think I'm getting on the screen. I'm not getting the slideshow. Are you getting the slideshow, others? Yes. Oh, well, I'm not any. Anyway. Okay, fine. Go no, ahead, please. Yeah. No, no. It's only you have to make full screen. I'm not getting full screen. Ah, that's fine. No, Great. no, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Residing at uh, Gonsalves Wadi Chins Pokli, uh, Gravida 3 Abortion 1 MTP 1 uh, came with 8 months of amenorrhea for regular ANC follow up. Uh, her last menstrual period uh, falls on uh, 18th of December 2022. Her uh, previous cycles were regular 28 days with average flow. Uh, as, hence, as per Nigli's rule, her expected date of delivery uh, was 24, uh, is 24th of uh, September 2023. Her period of gestation is 32, point, uh, 32 weeks, 6 days. Uh, no history of uh, any use of oral contraceptive pills or any other method of contraception. Uh, patient is married since 3 years. Uh, her first, con uh, first pregnancy, uh, she conceived 1 year after marriage. It was unplanned spontaneous conception. She underwent medical abortion at, uh, two, at 1 and a half months of I mean, uh, gestation. No history of check curettage. Uh, her second pregnancy was one year later. She had complete abortion at two months of gestation. No history of injection and TD received in previous two pregnancies. Uh, third pregnancy is present pregnancy. In first trimester, she registered in Baba Hospital in first trimester. Pregnancy confirmed by early scan. Two antenatal visits in first trimester. Uh, uh, two sonographies were done, uh, early scan and anti-scan, which was normal. Folic acid supplementation taken, routine antenatal investigations was normal. Uh, but uh, patient's blood group found to be AB negative. Husband's blood group done, it was O positive. Uh, indirect combs test done subsequently, which was negative. No history of any bleeding per vaginum in first trimester. In second trimester, uh, she had three antenatal visits, weakening at fifth month of gestation, immunized with two doses of injection tetanus, took iron and calcium supplementation regularly, anomaly scan done at 19 weeks, which was uh, normal with no gro gross congenital anomalies. Peter, Peter, look, I think we're running too quickly. Let's go back to the history. Go back in your slides. First slide, first slide. Let's go, let's go from the beginning itself. Now, she's, she's 24 years old and she's had uh, one abortion, one miscarriage, and you don't know her blood group. She starts for a routine. Now, yes. once, she, once she comes to you, she came with you with papers which give it had given her the blood group report when, when you saw her or it was from the first you have been seeing her. Or you knew the blood group when she came to you? Uh, sir, I knew blood group when she okay, came. Okay, let's back. assume she comes to you on the first visit. Take the next slide. What about this history which you have taken regarding miscarriages? How important are they in a patient who is RH negative? Uh, so first time, Mr. Uh, uh, She's uh, had one medical abortion, correct? Yes, yes. She's had a complete abortion. So yes. when a patient comes to you who is RS negative, suppose she comes with a report with a history of these two things. What comes yes. to your mind? She's had two things. So do you think we have to keep our eyes and ears open regarding two abortions here? Yes, sir. we should keep because so, fetomaternal hemorrhage uh, may occur in uh, 
abortions. Uh, most likely it occurs in the most after after doctors. threatened miscarriages and after yeah. terminations of pregnancy. Yes, sir. Correct. Can we have spontaneous uh, fetal metal hemorrhages in pregnancy? Means without any reason. We have not done anything. We come to the factors a little later. But do you have any any such situation that you are only spontaneous? Without any reason. We may just have a, a transplacental shift of fetal blood into the metron system. Can it occur in the first trimester? See, our concept, if you're talking about yes. RH prophylaxis later on. So what I want to ask you is that, can spontaneous fetal metal hemorrhage happen in a normal pregnancy? Uh, yes, sir, it can occur. When do you have any idea? In what trimesters can it happen? Or can it happen only in one trimester and not in the other trimesters? Uh, sir, it can occur in first trimester also and in second trimester also. When is it more likely? Um, so, uh, Ma'am, in uh, third trimester during uh, delivery. Third trimester per se. Yeah, okay. we are talking of silent silent hemorrhages without and not during delivery, but if it happens without the patient's knowledge, without any symptoms, that's the one we are asking you about. Is it more common? Why are we giving the anti-D at 28 weeks? Otherwise, we would have given it at the beginning of pregnancy, right? Um, I mean, second trimester, more likely uh, it can occur because of antipartum hemorrhage. Yes. No, that's that's normal pregnancies also can have. Can yes. I ask you the percentages of risk of transfer in the first trimester? Second, I'm talking about sensitization. I'm talking about the risk of transfer in the first trimester in an RS negative mother. 3%. Second yes. trimester, 16%. Third trimester, 45%. So as you go beyond 28 weeks, your risk of FMH is higher. That's the reason we give an RH at mm -hmm. about 28 weeks. Yes. Correct? Now, this yes. particular history you have, so what, what would be your next question to her when you asked her that you had these two things? Did you take anything? Uh, so, about NTD, I will ask, and uh, did she had a, uh, any surgical intervention? Uh, okay, let's come to the question. Okay. How does, when does fetal metal hemorrhage happen? In what conditions does it happen? We said spontaneous, done. Yes, next. You already said miscarriages. First yes. trimester, done. MTP, done. What next? So, uh, it can occur in ectopic pregnancy, uh, okay. vesicular mole. Okay. Uh, uh, Is it in all vesicular mole or a particular type of vesicular mole? No. It can occur only in partial uh, vesicular partial. mole, not the complete vesicular mole. Okay? Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Vesicular then, then follow after uh, that. Then uh, in amniocentesis. So, Perfect. Uh, cord, uh, uh, then in cordocentesis, uh, it can occur. Then antipartum hemorrhage. Yes. Um, antipartum, which type is more common? In abruption, sure, it happens in both, I agree, but in which case it happens more? In abruption or in class and bacteria? In uh, abruption. Okay. Anything else? Second trimester is more or first trimester the FMH is greater? Uh, so second trimester. Okay. Abdominal trauma? Uh, yes, sir. That, uh, that can also lead to uh, phytomaternal. And Anything post which we do? Anything which we do? Giving you a hint. Other than the procedures? Yes. Something which we do in the third trimester, not commonly done now, but for malpresentation, uh, what more do you uh, want to give you now? <laughs> sir, ma'am, uh, external. Uh, yes. So again, external. that when we are putting applying force, of course we do it very gently, but the force can cause some amount of shearing, sure. and then some transfer of blood. Fair enough. So now she's. So what do you, what did she tell you when you said whether you've taken injections? Uh, sir, she said that uh, she was not aware of her blood group and she has not taken any such in the, uh, okay. injection. Okay. Did you ask for her husband's blood group? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so after knowing her, uh, so after confirming her blood group, we did her husband's blood group also. So it was positive. My next question, so can an RH, RH positive father have a RS negative baby? 
Uh, can yes. an RH positive father have an RH negative baby? If so, when and what is the incidence? Mother negative, father positive, and the baby can be negative. So what will have, in which condition, what kind, kind of, let's put the zygosity now, feeding the Hetero, words in your mouth. Yeah, in uh, heterozygous. So, so what uh, is the chance the baby may be negative? So 50% chance. Perfect. So let's go ahead. Now, so you may have a positive now, father. Now I have mother. another question. Yes, sir. There was a couple, both were RH positive. Yes, sir. And uh, baby turned out to be RH negative. Yes. So husband started wondering, ki, how come my child is RH negative? So he started fighting with the wife. The matter went to the court. And you were called as an expert. Oh, yes. Sir. What advice will you give? Oh, sorry. If for... RH positive and baby turned out to be RH negative. Oh yes, sir. Sir, if uh, both the couples, if uh, fa father is uh, has a uh, heterozygous uh, uh, genes and even mother has heterozygous genes, then the negative uh, uh, negative of a uh, father and uh, mother. What negative. is the chance of the child being RH uh, negative if both of them are heterozygous? It is like an autosomal recessive inheritance. Yes, ma'am. Fifty percent chance. No, no 25%. 25%. 25%. 25%. Wonderful. Good. So now first trimester, you've seen her. Have you done a scan? She's uh, yes. all done, folic acid given, O positive, yes. and now we have an ICT done. So this is the first visit, first trimester ICT was done. Correct? Yes, okay. Let's go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, second trimester. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you could have seen at the anomaly scan? Just to be sure that the patient is not isoimmunized. Oh, so, ma'am, uh, cardiac anomalies and placenta. No, something which will tell you that the baby is anemic. Ma'am, uh, MCA, PSV, yes. Doppler. That's around that, 16 weeks is something you can make out better. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So now how often would you know she, she's come to you, let's say at 10 weeks, you've done an ICT negative. Yes. And she's had she's had uh, two miscarriages, one miscarriage, one MTP and entity has not been taken. Yes. So what would be your approach now? Second trimester, did you do any ICT? Did you, after four yes. weeks or something, was it required to be done in her at least? Uh, sir, I did uh, ICT at 28 weeks. So in between, let's say nine and... 28 weeks was an ICT required in her, in her specifically. Then you had to this thing. Oh, in other words, yes. one at nine weeks you did and the other at 28 weeks. We, yes. we were taught at least, I don't know, the recent consists to do it every four weekly, but in a patient who has been given, not given entity with, with two abortions, miscarriages, Dr. Purnima, do you think we would have done it four weekly in her? Or you yes, the problem is it. that some of the uh, ICTs are falsely coming negative. Exactly, so we have to be very that's careful. a big problem now. We have to repeat them also so, and we have to also do the Doppler. That way Doppler, Doppler is, Doppler is what weeks. is going to give risk to a key. Eri, tell me something. Suppose she is ICT negative even at 28 weeks. What happened to those miscarriages? She's not taking an entity. Why wasn't she immunized? Why, why, why didn't aluminization happen at her? We say, no, Baba, MTP, MTP, I have done and this and that. What could have been possible? Why did she not get immunized, in other words? Because we are afraid. Hey, MTP is hale, tuja, entity nahi getla, wat lagli. So why what nahi laga? And when, when does we don't have a problem? Tell me that. Now, this patient has two MTPs. One MTP, yes. one miscarriage. There's a risk yes. of FMS. She's not taking an entity, but her ICT is negative. Or, uh, this thing, MCA, PSV is absolutely normal. Yes. What could have happened in her? What are the possibilities where the patient doesn't get RH aluminized in spite of having an FMH? What determines sensitization? Let's come to the question in another way. What factors determine whether the patient is going to be immunized or not, or aluminized or not? Let's okay. take it. Amount of fetal metal hemorrhage is important. It is, uh, yes. So what what is the fetal, critical volume? Uh, sensitizing uh, volume? Uh, more than 1 is to 16. Like, critical volume of fetal RBCs. Uh, fetal RBCs. 0. Uh, more than 0. 0.1 ml. Okay. So with, the, with, with 0. 0.1 ml, what is the risk of sensitization she has? Um, 3%. 3%. 3%. With, with, with a volume of about 0. 0.25, what is the risk of sensitization she has? 25%. 25. 
when the volume exceeds 5 ml the risk goes beyond 60% so yes. what are the factors one will be the amount of fmh okay second yes. factor she may not get sensitized in spite of having a volume of 2 ml let's put uh, it abo in. incompatibility can yes be abo incompatibility may not give her and the third factor so. important responder or not responder or a minimal responder immune system may not respond okay. so you may have almost one third of patients who may not respond to, to the rh antigen so you may not have any such aluminization. Dr. Purnima, please correct me if I mistake because you are a, you are no, a, no, an you are absolutely right. You're, you're, you're an expert at all this. So you are absolutely right. My own grandmother at 82 had a fracture neck femur and probably had her blood group done for the first time. And she was RH negative. She had seven children and she was never sensitized. <laughs> so this <laughs> girl could be one, at the age one, of, 82, of the three. So she was the non-responder. So one that happens three. very commonly. And suppose she had come to you after abortion and would have said anti I will give. So what is the dose you would have given? Uh, so 50 microgram. Uh, below 12 weeks, I would have given. Uh, 50, 50, I think, is not available. I think what I know, only 100 and 300 are available. 100, yes. So we, will it be polyclonal or monoclonal? Uh, polyclonal. Which will you prefer and why? Which is the ideal? And which is we have to give? No option. What is the difference? How are they obtained? Poly means what and mono means what? Simple. So mono means single and poly means uh, So you have heard about plasma donor, single donor and multiple donors? Yes, sir. So same way over here. So many antibodies, polyclonic, will cover a greater because D we only attacking D, but there are other also and anti antigens we can cause immunization. So then polyclonal was better, but there was a human source. Now this mm -hmm. is a lab source, the one which we are monoclonal. So the risk of infection and anaphylaxis and some reactions was greater with polyclonal, plus the difficulty in making volumes. So here is a question where we have to deal with the simpler and maybe not as, as, as effective as poly, but the monoclonal version. We don't have the polyclonal in the market right now. At the moment, it's not available. So this yeah. generation does not know about it. Also. Okay. Everybody has to give monoclonal. And in which year was anti-D started in the US, by the way, sir, already made a passing mention. When did anti-D come into existence in US means FD approved? Any idea about the year? Because you're doing well. So we said, let's push this question. US, India, can you US. 1967, the US FDA said, okay, valid, use it. Okay. Right, go ahead, Nat. For 28 me, weeks. Yes, sir, please. Sorry. Tell me why injection NTD was given at 28 weeks only. Why not 27 weeks? Why not 26 weeks? Why specifically 28 weeks? Any particular reason? How long does it last in the circulation? For, uh, for six weeks, it lasts. 12 weeks. 12 weeks. So at 40 weeks, you have to deliver the patient in case patient goes into post-datism. At 40 weeks, weeks, you have to give another dose of 300 microgram at that time. Yes. Before delivery, okay? Yes. Chalo, aage. Uh, she carry, uh, third, uh, third trimester. Yeah, ICT, I just go back. How much will you give at 28 weeks? Single dose or we have two doses in the third trimester? What is the one we recommended today? 28 oh, weeks ICD negative, you get 300 micrograms. Yes, sir. There was an, another regimen which was given earlier was 28 and 34, 100 and 100. But I think this is what is recommended. Yes, sir. Uh, earlier it was 150 uh, microgram at 28 weeks. I understand better, but we are not getting 150 now. So, it is 100. Yes, so now this is what is recommended, 300. We, we have an, I was a resident, 50 was available. Now, mm -hmm. I, I don't see even 50s. I don't see 150s. It's 100 and 300 now. So you give it at 28. Where will you give it? Buttocks or shoulder or abdomen? Uh, so over deltoid. Uh, Any deltoid reason? Is, is it painful? Uh, no, sir. Why would uh, it right? Then? Uh, sir, Any reason? Easy uh, to sir, approach. No, sir. So because in gluteal region, uh, uh, it is uh, absorption is... Uh, yes, absorption is better. Yes. Okay, so give it in the deltoid region and deltoid then that's region. how it goes. Is it important to her ICT subsequently if she's been given NTD? And we have not, that we didn't have any other complications of APH and all that in the third trimester. 
So if we uh, do ICT in, uh, after giving NTD, then it will uh, be positive only. To what extent? How what much? extent? How much? Three, uh, three weeks. No, no, no. Tighter. One is to four. Yeah, either one is to two, one is two to four, one is not four. more than that. What is the critical title, by the way, Ambika? I'm sorry, not Ambika, Bhagishri. Uh, so it is uh, more than one is to 16. It is lab dependent, by and large. And since mm -hmm. not very many are being done now, standardization is a big problem. How much should depend? Dr. Burnim will be able to tell us that on ICTs. But Can it you is define lab dependent. It? Can you define what is critical title? Critical title. Oh. So, um, Ma'am, it is uh, the level of sensitization which can cause uh, 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 fetal anemia. Oh. No, no, no. If it... Uh, uh, is the level below which there are no deaths in the babies. Yes. So up till that point, you feel you are safe and that depends on your lab. You should know what is the titer for your lab because of the standardization differences. You should be aware what is the critical titer for your lab. So if you are sending regularly the titers and if it's remaining below the critical titer, then you are quite sure that nothing will go wrong. Of course, this was a little old-fashioned view. Now we are going totally by color Doppler, but at least it's a guideline you know, in the beginning. Suppose in the first visit only I get a titer of 1024, then I know that this patient is very severely sensitized. Or if it, I get 1 is to 8, I know that she's sensitized, but she's very mildly sensitized and she may not have any problem. Okay. So critical title usually is around 1 is to 16, but it has to be standardized. You have to check your lab what is the critical title. Go ahead. Uh, she carried the pregnancy uneventfully till date. Two visits uh, till date. Uh, BP and blood sugar values were normal. No history of pain in abdomen, bleeding or leaking per vaginum, trauma to abdomen. Suppose no. she was managed ISO immunized, what all effects can occur on the mother? I am not talking about the fetus. Suppose the titer turned out to be 1 in 4 or 1 in 2. Does RHA ISO immunization have any effect on the mother? We all talk about fetus, no? Yes. Any effect on the mother? Uh, it can cause preeclampsia. Why? It causes preeclampsia due to hyperplacentosis. You will always find a huge placenta in cases of RH. What other effects can it have? If the baby has got hydrox and the mother develops edema all over the body, what is it called? Poly, uh, polyhydromnus. No, there is a word for this. Where the mother also looks starts looking like the fetus because she's swollen all over. Maternal mirror syndrome. So the mother also mirrors the appearance of the baby. Other problems which can occur in the mother is big baby, PPH, DIC due to IUFD and even hydramnios. Okay? Yes. Chalo aage. No, uh, no significant contributory past or family history. Uh, dietary history patient is vegetarian, uh, consumes 2,190 kilocalorie per day. Protein intake uh, is 60 grams per day. Or uh, socioeconomic history, she belongs to lower middle class uh, according to modified Kupuswami scale. Uh, her personal uh, history, uh, she has normal sleep, diet, bowel, bladder habits, no history of any addiction. On general examination, patient is conscious, cooperative, well-oriented with time, place, person, moderately built, adequately nourished. Uh, her height is 152 centimeter and her weight is 66 kg. Uh, weight gain, total weight gain is uh, 8 kg. Her BMI is 26 uh, kg per meter square. On uh, general examination, her uh, general condition is fair or uh, febrile. Pulse rate is 82 beats per minute regular. Blood pressure 120 by 70 millimeters of mercury taken in right upper arm sitting position at the level of heart. Uh, respiratory rate uh, 18 cycles per minute. No history of uh, no uh, pelar, ictus, sinusis, clubbing, thyromegaly or any pedal edema scene. 
bilateral breast uh, soft normal changes of pregnancy seen. Uh, cardiovascular and respiratory systems are within normal limit. On per abdominal examination, uh, on inspection, abdomen uniformly distended till ZP sternum. Uterine ovoid aligned longitudinally, umbilicus central and everted. Linear nigra and stria gravidarum C, no dilated veins, all uh, hernial sites intact. On palpation, fundal height corresponds to 32 weeks of gravid uterus. Symphysial fundal height is 32 cm and abdominal circumference is 80 cm. Uterus uh, relaxed. Uh, grips first uh, grip, uh, soft, broad, non palatable structure, pale, suggestive of breach. Uh, second Leopold's grip, multiple knob like structure, felt on right side, suggestive of fetal limb, and smooth, curved, resistant feel on left side, suggestive of fetal back. Uh, third grip, hard globular palatable structure suggestive of head. Uh, fourth grip, head is not engaged. Uh, it is five pal uh, palpable. On auscultation, fetal heart sounds heard on left spinal umbilical line. It was it is one forty six beats per minute regular. Uh, so summary of my case is twenty four years old, gravita three abortion one MTP one, with thirty two weeks six days uh, of gestation, with the uh, RH negative pregnancy uh, with RH negative pregnancy with uh, indirect Combs test negative with singleton cephalic presentation received antenatal anti D prophylaxis at 28 weeks came for regular ANC follow. What will be your plan for delivery of this patient? Uh, Ma'am, because she is a uh, ICT negative, uh, I will uh, uh, terminate pregnancy at 40 weeks of gestation. I will Okay. Wait till uh, 40 weeks of gestation and after that, uh, after delivery, I will uh, uh, confirm. Wait, wait, wait. Don't, don't run to delivery so early now. Suppose uh, what is more important in antenatal is that is it, does a hemoglobin matter? Suppose she's 10.5 gram percent. She is O. No, no, I'm putting it as AB negative. Let's put it AB negative. Okay, she's AB negative, right? She is AB yes, negative. sir. Suppose 10.5 is a hemoglobin at 32 weeks now at this given time. Yes. Are you worried? Would you work, in other words, would you work on a RH negative mother a little more enthusiastically, energetically to bring her hemoglobin as high as you can? Uh, yes, sir, I will work because uh, it is a rare blood group. Mm. Exactly. That's why. So you will try your best That's for her to I cross will... 11 at any cost because all your reserves are going to get over at 32 weeks. You have to pump everything before 32 in pregnancy with iron. If you have lost that window, you have to see that she takes iron regularly. You do her hemoglobin again at 36 weeks and see what the hemoglobin is there. And again at term when she's about to deliver. You know that what where we are standing. Because believe me, AB negative blood and most of the negative bloods are not available. And doctors are in a big fix to deliver these patients in, in their nursing home at least. That's where the crux is. So work on a negative woman right from the beginning on her hemoglobin the moment. So your first visit, second visit, third visit, should I look at a hemoglobin? If you are in why this thing, check her hemoglobin every couple of months and see. Because yes. most That's of the patients will become less in the third point. time. It's a very third, important third, practical third, point. Third, and third also we is. tell them to find people in the family who might be also able to donate yeah. at yes. the time, last minute when we are running around for blood. So we make them aware that this is a rare blood group and there can be problems. So now she's 38 weeks. What will you do? Wait and watch or induce? What are the pros and cons of inducing? Hold him, huh? When, when we say that no, make the family aware, it does not necessarily mean that no, you get the family members because you don't allow the family members to donate. Yeah, you not the brother, sister. Unrelated. Yeah. Unrelated. But they have in the extended uh, family yes. and friends. Yes. Friends, friends, yeah. And and the and, uh, second is, uh, thing is, when you, would you, uh, uh, would you monitor this pregnancy only with the RH titer or uh, would you monitor them with ultrasound as well? And which is more important? Of course, Purnima uh, has answered that question. Yes, but just sir. to reiterate. Uh, sir, uh, Doppler is more important than uh, RH titer. So how you know the sensitivity? Uh, yes. Ma'am, it should be less than 1.5 uh, uh, moms. No, no. As a test, how good is color Doppler? How good is the middle cerebral artery peak systolic velocity as a test? 
So what is the sensitivity of the test? Uh, Ma'am, it is 100%. 100%. Uh, 100%. 100%. Very good. And what is the other problem, slight problem which you have? Do you have a false positive or a false negative? What you don't want to have, false negative or false positive? False positive. You don't want to have false positive. You don't want to miss them. So you don't want a false negative. So luckily there is no false negative, but there is approximately 12% false positive, which doesn't matter that much because you know you will then take decisions accordingly, depending on her gestational age. And false positives increase after 35 weeks. So that is where the worry comes in. Yes. Achha, since you are doing so well on MCA, PCA, PSP, in which year did it come into play? Any idea? And the name linked with it? Since you're doing well, Bhagis is not you know, something which is uh, asked in most of the exams. But since you're doing well, you're going on the right track. Any idea which year? Because we know 19, 18, 1980, every and, and, and one more question to this is, what was the earlier method of fetal analysis uh, earlier than this? Suppose ICD was positive before 2000. What is the method? Just name the method. Uh, the Lily's, Lily's chart. Oh. But what, what did they do? Mm -hmm. And what was plotted on the Lily's chart? Amniocentesis was done? Yes, sir. And uh, he met Spectro up. Spectrophotometric Spectro analysis of bilirubin. And then accordingly, they had and then they charted and they saw the curve going this way, that way. Yes. The yes. curves also come in your MCA, PSV. But this was Lily. 2000, mm -hmm. Mari et al. came with this concept of MCA, PSV. What is the basis of this? What is the relation between RH and this brain blood supply? I mean, what, what is the link? The blood group and the baby's uh, MCA. Why? How does concept originate? And what is that mom thing they're trying to say that uh, the MCA is going to be higher than that? Why does the MCA increase in sensitized uh, mothers or even, uh, even the babies affected? Uh, sir, well, if in anemia, the, there is more... Uh, Who's anemia? Mothers or farmer? Fetal sorry, fetal, uh, fetal anemia, more uh, blood uh, goes to brain. Uh, so compensatory, compensatory tachycardia happens. Uh -huh. Right, anemia, anemia itself initiates compensatory tachycardia, more blood blood put in the MCA. That's how the uh, this thing is taken as 1.5 mom, right? It yeah. is That's actually to do with the viscosity of the blood. The viscosity of the blood becomes less, and that less viscous blood flows very rapidly Faster, in the middle yeah. cerebral artery. And uh, usually we are doing it in the late pregnancy, and the head is down, and so it yeah. is very easy to get that vessel, which is. From the circle of villis, it straight comes. It's not a tortuous vessel. It comes straight and you can, you have to take it at a zero degree angle, okay? So, when the head is transverse and the vessel is coming up towards you, it's very easy to put the probe there and to get a zero degrees. Otherwise, you could do other vessels also. So it is not so much to do with the brain sparing effect. It is to do with the rush of the blood because of lowered viscosity. Does it cause tachycardia? There is no fetal tachycardia as such. No, 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 that is a late sign. Yeah. That will happen, but it's a late sign. But this, this will happen immediately, proportionately to the enemy. Go ahead, Beta. So would okay, you like to do it one once one. at... You know, yeah, sorry. Karthi, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. Now, how often will you do it? How frequently will you do these color Dopplers in RH negative mothers? Are you asking you, the student or are you asking me? No, no, no. <laughs> you, you have to answer the question if the student doesn't. Yeah. No, if they are to, unsensitized, then we would not bother so much. But when we were looking at them at 32 weeks and then at term once, we would definitely put the probe and have a look at it. I mean, if you are doing the sonography, you don't want to waste the opportunity, right? Generally, we would do a growth scan around 32 to 34 weeks and then we would probably do one at 38 weeks to see that everything is fine. So at that time, we look at the MCA PSV because sometimes unexpectedly we may, we may find that something has been missed out in the ICT, but it is picked up by this. True, true. What complication are you afraid in the baby, the worst complication of uh, sensitization of the mother? Oh. What is it called? Uh, heart failure. No, no, no. What, what is this called? The fetus is called with a particular name, right? Fetal what? Uh, Hydrops? So what is fetal hydrops? Before that, before that, what happens? See, there's a series of events, isn't it? Yes. 
Yes. It starts off with destruction of the blood cells. So baby will try to compensate. So what does the baby do? What cells will come into the circulation, the immature forms? You know what are the immature forms called? When you have a malignancy, you know, you have those cells. Blasts. Blasts. Erythroblasts, yeah. Yes. There are a lot of erythroblasts in the blood. So it is the initially, it is called erythroblastospitalis. So how do they come? Where are they manufactured? Don't say China. No. Where are they manufactured? Because those oh, areas will grow in the baby. Oh, I mean bone marrow. Yeah, adults it is bone marrow. But in the baby it is liver, spleen and also even the skull. Not only the long bones but even the skull. So all these areas will grow, the liver and spleen will hypertrophy. So you'll start seeing all this on ultrasound. Yes. Then subsequently what will happen? So how, how does the hydrops evolve? So now the baby is still trying to compensate by manufacturing more blood cells, pushing immature cells into the circulation. Then Splenomegaly will be there. Yes. Oh, plus, uh, placentomegaly. Oh. Yes. Oh. And then, as we said, there will be a hyperdynamic heart. circulation. Yes. And then the heart will start heart failing. failing. Yes. Once the heart starts failing, combined with the anemia and because of liver function being poor now, there will be hypoproteinemia. So combination of all these will cause something like a congestive cardiac failure in the adult with ascites, pleural effusion, skin edema. That is hydrospitalis. Uh, which fetus is more affected, male or female? Hydrospital. In C, more in males or in females? Male fetus is, I mean. Male. It male can fetus. be a, at highest 10 times more. I don't know the reason. I can throw some light on it. But it's supposed to be more common in male fetuses. Apart from your cardiac failure, which are the other causes of hydrops? We've got cardiac failure done. Hepatic dysfunction, albumin, oncotic pressure being less. Portal hypertension can happen in the babies. Lymphatic, because of the increase in the uh, CVP and all the limit, the compression of lymphatics is there. And by, as, as you said, myocardial dysfunction. So hydrops baby doesn't mean the end of the road. It is, it is a great amount of work by the fetal medicine specialist who's going to now pinch in and start getting the baby out of it. So all the details, I think Dr. Purnima will handle then. So don't think hydrops is the end of the road. Maybe we lose some, but we save a lot many. Okay, so now she's, uh, she's not going in labor. She's 40 weeks. Will you induce now? Uh, yes, sir. I will induce her. Yes, you have to. All the regular yes. conditions of obstetrics, yes. you have to induce. Don't take RS negative into it. Okay. Uh, well, precautions during inductions are the routine. Now, let's come to delivery of these patients, RS-negative patients. How do you proceed of a mother who is RS-negative, not sensitized, and she's coming to you in labor? So, what are the things you'll be looking at, the important points? Not the every step, but what are the things special for an RS-negative mother? Uh, as I said, hemoglobin, very, very careful. Yes. Keep your blood in case blood you can keep your reserve. blood ready. You never yes. know. Okay. Following that, oxytocin. She's not, she's not yes. progressing. She's, can use? Uh, yes, sir. Can use. Can use. Can use. Okay. Now she's not bearing in the second stage. She's, uh, almost three hours have elapsed now. Apply any instrumentation. Are you liberal with the instrumental deliveries in RS negative? Can you apply them? Are you worried about FMH? Yes, sir. We are uh, worried about FMH. Are you worried about FMH? Yes, sir. But that is that is that is not so important in the baby. You know, we can handle FMH by giving her entities dosages. Okay, she has delivered. Now, baby has just come out. What what will you start from that particular moment? Baby's head is crowning, you are given an episode to me and the baby is just coming out. How will you proceed now? Is there a role of active management of third stage? 
Uh, yes, active management of third stage will be done and uh, mm -hmm. early cord clamping. Mm -hmm. And uh, immediate, immediate, immediate cord clamping. Cord clamping. And how much, what is the length of the cord that you will keep? Short cord or long cord? Oh, I'm long, Why? long cord. How long? Oh, around one centimeter. One centimeter? My God, there's not even a normal fetus. <laughs> 10 to 15 centimeter and why what is an IV access for a neonate if you want a good IV access you know how small their veins are yes where do they do you know what they cannulate umbilical vein yes so suppose the baby requires an exchange transfusion, then the neonatologist will require that cord yes. cannulation. You collect cord blood also for what? Uh, uh, for baby's blood group to see baby's blood group, hemoglobin, bilirubin and uh, DCT. So in how many tubes will you collect? Mm -hmm. Which tubes? Ma'am, two EDTA and uh, two EDTA bulb and two plain bulb. Okay. Have you collect? Okay. How much should the cord bilirubin be? Do you know what is the cutoff when they get worried and they say this baby will require an exchange transfusion immediately? Bilirubin more than twenty. More than twenty. Now see, when the baby is in the womb, the baby's bilirubin levels are not very high because the mother is clearing them continuously. Yes. Okay? Yes. So, if you are talking about physiological jaundice, we are saying 12. That is not the situation when the baby is in the womb. So, if even if it is 4 milligrams per cent, then that is not a good sign. So, 4 is the cutoff for immediate exchange for cord bilirubin. Anything else? Will you give methargin? Uh, no, ma'am. We will avoid methargin. What will it cause? Uh, it will cause fetomaternal hemorrhage. Because it will cause a very strong contraction of the uterus. So there will be more fetomaternal hemorrhage. Will you massage the uterus prophylactically? No, because no, we have a no tendency massage to massage every uterus. baby. Avoid in these cases. Yeah. Avoid. Unless he's bleeding, of course. Then all the emphasis on preventing of PPH. You're not bothered about anti-Ds. You're not bothered yeah. about anything else. If she's bleeding, forget it. You got to stop that bleeding because blood is not easily accessible. Plus, you have to you have even a little amount of this will be in a frenzetic state. So go for it, stop it. Use your carboprost, mesoprost. If she's bleeding, just go headlong. Don't compromise on that. Okay. Where so can your yeah? Yeah, go ahead. Suppose all this happened, she got PPH, you had to give massage, you had to give methogen, and then now your baby's blood group has come O positive and you have given her 300 micrograms of anti-D, okay? Yes. yes. Now, you are expecting that maybe there was a large fetomaternal hemorrhage. So, how will you test for that? How will you know how much to give? Um, Ma'am, acid dilution test, uh, clay or bed kit test uh, is there. Uh, so when will you do it? Will you do it at delivery or will you do it after giving the dose? See, at delivery, we don't know whether the baby is positive or negative. We don't know the blood group. Yes. When should you give the dose? And um, Ma'am, within 72 hours of delivery. But your blood group report has come in three hours. Will you wait? No, immediately. So we come to that question which Dr. Mohan yeah. said. Why, why 72 hours was taken? We say an up to 70, now that even if you miss the word at 72, you can still catch it a little later. May not be very effective, but it is better to have something than nothing. So why 72 hours? Your answer is I'm giving you a gold. Chalo. I'm giving you a gold medal right away. <laughs> I didn't know it. Honest. I didn't know it till date. <laughs> Well, it looks like you really read up for this uh, discussion. No, no. This was thanks to my friend, Jesse. He was saying, 
Hey, you know something? I said, no, I didn't know this. Anyway, look, I'm without wasting much time. Uh, what is happening is I spoke about the prison to you, sing and sing at Hudson River, yeah, yeah, this thing in, in the US, 1800s. So what they did is once they injected this thing, the jail authorities never allowed those doctors or those uh, those people to come and collect the blood for three days, 72 hours. So the gap of 72 hours between each collection after administrating the positive blood. So an arbitrary limit of 72 hours was created because they picked up antibodies after that, hopefully hoping that so it's a very arbitrary cutoff. It is not a definite cutoff, not, not backed by any great studies. But 72 hours came into play because the blood of the prisoners was collected after release because they were allowed only after three days to visit the prison by the jail authorities. So, so there's no scientific the basis. Scientifically, we have to give it as soon as possible. You get the report. You can. And even if you miss the deadline, you can give it to up to 10 days because you will get some benefit. The benefit will go on reducing. But it's not that 72 hours nikal gaya to abhi kuch fayda nahi hai. It's not what is the half life of antibody? About 21 days. Okay, madam asks you a question. How will you estimate the blood loss? What is it? Can you give me a little idea about the Clio Bethke test? What is the basis? What is the rationality of doing the test? What, what, what in fact is the saying that because of this, we are able to calculate? You said acid illusion test, right? So, so, so fetal, fetal cells, fetal uh, hemoglobin, HPF, is it resistant to acid or sensitive to acid? So it is resistant, resistant to acid. Resistant. So once you add on and you do your staining with that, what happens is, will you see the fetal cells as red, fetal red cells, cells or pink cells or red. rose colored cells and maternal uh, cells will be adult hemoglobin will be ghost cells. Correct? Yes. So how will you estimate the fetal maternal hemorrhage? There's a formula. Oh, yes, sir. I okay. Do you know it? I'll, oh, I'll, I'll tell you. Percentage of red cells, I mean the red cells of the fetus. Okay. Yes. Percentage multiplied by 50 will give you the amount of FMH. And depending on the FMH, will you calculate it? Now, you tell me, suppose my FMH is uh, 300 cc. So, what is the dose of entity I'll give? Okay, come to the other but, way. But how much, how many ml of blood does 300 micrograms of antity cover? Hopefully covers ml, 15, ml. I'm talking about whole ml. blood. Uh, 15, 15 ml. 15 pack cells, 30 yes. whole blood. Okay, yes. so 330. So 300 micrograms, 30 ml. Now you have got about 100. So you divide the fetal metal hemorrhage by the number of, okay. by the number 30. So if I get something like 120 divided by 30 is 4 vials yes. of 300. So 1200. Normally we don't exceed 1200 to 1500. And that also is given intermittently 6 to 8 hourly 300 bolus. If you don't push them IV, we don't give them as a bolus. So mm -hmm. these are questions which perhaps if you are doing very well may pushed on to you. What is clever bed kit test? What is the FMH level? Achha, in which case is the FMH higher? Let's see now she's delivering. Is the FMH higher during, as you say, instrumental deliveries, PPH is it is higher, then your LSCS is it, isn't it higher during Fine. section? LSCS, it is higher. Yes. So that is where, but by and look at 30 ml is pretty good. You are suspecting, then you go for the Clyver bed kit test. But 300 mm -hmm. covers 30 ml. Mm -hmm. And one more thing, what is the basis of RH? Uh, the prophylaxis business came into play. Why? Where this concept got originated, let's cover at 28 and let's not wait for the mother to deliver at and then think about positive baby and then give anti-D. What are we achieving with giving antenatal prophylaxis? What is the reduction in risk to the baby? What is the risk of sensitization after only giving the postpartum, uh, this thing, 72 hour while anti-D? Around 2%. It comes down to 0.2% if you are doing it at 28 weeks. So the risk is so little. So hence the concept of anti-D prophylaxis came into play at 28 weeks. If the patient says, I don't have money, I can take it now or I can take it at delivery, then when will you give it? I'm at uh, delivery, after delivery. Yes. yes. Because the chances of sensitization are 16% after delivery. Yes. My question is, ABO incompatibility occurs immediately, while RH antibody, uh, RH incompatibility doesn't occur immediately. Why? Sir, 
So because it takes 38 days to... So how do you get antibody titer? Okay. You understood my question? Yes, sir. ABO incompatibility occurs yes. immediately and you are not worried as far as RH sensitization is concerned. But RH sensitization takes a little longer time. Why? What are the type of antibodies in ABO mm -hmm. and in RH? Oh, Ma'am, I first IgM antibodies are uh, there that doesn't cross the placenta. And uh, 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 later on IgG antibodies, uh, it takes almost 38 days. Okay, but what, ABO is what kind of antibodies? They cause agglutination, right? And yes. IgG causes hemolysis. IgM type. ABO is IgM type. And they will not cross. Otherwise, everybody would have got. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because it is so common to have a child with a different blood group than you. Bagesh, how does the anti-D work? These antibodies go and kill the RBCs? Make it hemoly hemolysis happens? How does it work? You give anti-D, you got about, let's yes. say, 5ml of pitometal hemorrhage in that patient. How does it work? The belief initially was that these antibodies go and cause hemolysis of the cells and destroy and not allow the antigen to be exposed. Now, we still don't know the cause. Two important theories they have said is it is macrophage-mediated clearance. Once these uh, antigens are coated with the antibodies, the clearance by the macrophages. And the second thing is the down regulation of the antigen specific B lymphocytes, which are forming antibodies. So make them not to react to it. This is what I've read, and this is what I feel. This is the only hemolysis is not the primary. I mean, I used to think of late that hemolysis is the thing and it breaks the blood. No, it doesn't. That may not be a main factor. These down regulation seems to play a role here. That is the concept, probably why most some patients don't, don't react to the RH antigen and known as non responders. Purnima, correct me if I'm wrong, please. I don't know. I'm yeah, just hitting it. It will get around. coated and it will go into the reticuloendothelial yeah. system. It will not neutralize in the circulation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's it. Should we serve? Should we take off from here? What is the lifespan of RBC and WBC? <laughs> RBC, you must know. Uh, RBC is 120 days. Yes. WBC is 8 to 18 days. Okay. Yes. Suppose uh, how soon the RH uh, RH antigen is seen on a embryo? How soon do you get RH? Oh, so 38 days. 38 days. So in case you do menstrual regulation at uh, 14 days overdue or 10 days overdue, will you give NTD? Oh, yes, sir. Maybe. No, no, sir. Why? So, because 28 day, uh, 24 days. Oh. So, because it will be only 24 days uh, embryo, that's why. The sensitization is less likely okay. to occur and the sensitization, even if it occurs, it will be with less than 0.1 ml. Yes. Okay? Yes. Suppose it is twins. Will you give double dose? Uh, no, sir. Why? Twins and triplets delivering. Will you give double dose or triple dose? Uh, no, sir. I will give the uh, same dose and... I will calculate uh, then, uh, if any additional fetomaternal uh, hemorrhage has occurred or not. Very, Very good. good. Excellent. Anything else, Manohar, you want to talk? No, no, no. I think we have, she has done very well. 
with so uh, with uh, experts and asking a questions bhagesh you have done very well i hope yes. you have gone richer even i have become richer in knowledge so yes. thank you, yes. you so very much for being around and joining yes. this rant spread to your friends we need people to come forward in present cases because yes. in the end of the day you'll realize that uh, it's really worth it because once you face the examiners in the exam perhaps your confidence would have gone higher yes and in case we've been aggressive we are we apologize no sir so, so you were very lenient <laughs> thank you anyway sir. chalo thank yes, you ji bye bye you ma'am then wonderful bye event bye thank you ma'am well friends that's it that's that's the first case we had uh, she is she, she is from bandra baba hospital uh, from mumbai and now to put more light on the subject we have nobody who's better than uh, dr purnima sadoskar friends let me tell you one thing she's an excellent academician as excellent even as a skillful surgeon her entire career she's been into academic she's an avid reader she's got tremendous tons of knowledge and a recent perhaps not so recent love is fetal medicine she has come from a very premier institute uh, from k f from k m hospital uh, mumbai and she's a professor and head of the unit at, at naurozi wadia maternity hospital and say gs medical college and also she's head of the fetal medicine department at wadia hospital her love for fetal medicine took her across the world in fact she's been trained at israel at boston she also got the hargobind fellowship in fetal medicine as as always she loves the students the students love her and she's got tremendous amount of uh, publications all across and i'll tell you one thing she's extremely precise to the point and she's been on a groups of academics where her answers have been so precise and razor sharp no beating around the bush without taking more time of you people i think you you just find it out for yourself uh, about the abilities of dr purnima satoshkar so here's uh, here's purnima to you the stage is all yours hey Thank you, you got so you got so much a, for that kind introduction manohar i hope there are some wrong... students because i can see very few participants i'm just hoping that they are all sharing the same laptop or something um, um, ambika ambika is ambika ram this is not her topic madam's topic is rh iso immunization acha this is the uh, are we taking the case or are we taking this i think we'll take the case na i mean we'll take the topic talk, i think talk. uh, yeah talks ambika please change this this is the next I case i will share my screen you yeah, allow please, me to yeah. share my screen please do that so i hope there are participants Purnima, madam, this is this is a faculty link. We have the other link. About three hundred plus people there. Oh, great! It's not. No, no. This is this. Uh, no, no. This faculty link is a separate link because there will be okay. no disturbance between the two links. Right, so this right. is an isolated link. So we'll be just five, seven of us on this. So let me know. Am I able to? I can't share share my screen because the other participant is. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm just stopping. Yeah. Akanksha, is it? Okay, now I'll. Yes, ma'am. Please proceed. Okay, are you all able to see? Yes. It's full screen, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. So I'll just start a little bit from the basics. I think she has already talked about it. Our student was very good, very clear in her ideas. So this is just to show how the uh, Rh group is. Uh, the Rh antigen has three components actually. There is one intracytoplasmic. transmembranous and extracytoplasmic and the extracytoplasmic components of the antigen are protruding from the red cell membrane whereas the rh negative it's a smooth membrane and there is nothing protruding over there so when we add anti d then it will link these adjacent cells and you will get clumping this is when we are trying to ascertain the group of the patient in the blood bank whereas no clumps means it is rh negative now this d antigen is not only like this but it's a very colorful fellow as you will see over here and we will see the significance of this little bit later on now allo immunization or as we call it rh negative mother when she carries an rh positive fetus produces igg antibodies when the rh antigen stimulates the maternal immune system by entering the maternal circulation and this happens in the subsequent pregnancy and in the subsequent pregnancy igg antibodies cross the placenta and cause fetal anemia that is the basis 
Now, looking a little bit at the genetics of the uh, uh, D, D antigen, actually there are three types of RH antigens, C, D, and E, and Ooh. each of them, each of them has a, these are the genes and alleles, and each of them has an antigen except the D gene. There is no D uh, uh, antigen which has been identified. And uh, you can have the small D, that is. You can have a dominant and a recessive type of uh, antigen, and the small D has not been identified. So there can be, there are three which are inherited from the mother and three from the father. So you can get various combinations like this. And depending on, now out of all these, the most immunogenic is D. So although C and E are also there, we focus on D because D is the one which is causing problems. So if there is even, because it's inherited in a dominant fashion, even a single D can give rise to an RH positive baby. Whereas as we saw in the example, when we were asking the case, you can have, if both of the small C, small D, small E come, then we can have an RH negative baby. Now, if, now this is a report, typical report. We can do the testing at the National Institute of Immunohematology, which is on the 13th floor of KEM. They are doing the testing for zygosity. And if the father is heterozygous RH positive, there's a 50% chance that the fetus is RH negative. So you can see here. Now what they do is they test these antigens and then they know the probability in the given population. So suppose, let's go back to this. Suppose they find when they are testing the father, they find that there is a capital C and capital D. Then they know that in the population, this is the most common commonly occurring variant. So they are sort of guessing, okay? So most probable genotype they will give you. But then that will often tell you whether it is homozygous or heterozygous. Now what are epitopes? Epitope is a small site on an antigen which is to which a complementary antibody may specifically bind. And that is known as an epitope or antigenic determinant. And what is the structure of this epitope? It is made of one to six monosaccharides or five to eight amino acid residues on the surface of the antigen. So there will be, again, coming back to this colorful fellow, the D antigen. These are the different epitopes. So it's a very, very heterogeneous or a very polymorphic type of antigen. That is the problem. And there can be some variants which can cause confusion in the blood bank or they can cause confusion in your mind whether you are supposed to treat them as a RH positive or an RH negative. So you can see here that this is the full complement of the epitopes in an RH uh, positive patient. And here you can see that the number of antigens are less. So this is a weak D. And in the other one, you can see that some of the epitopes are missing. So you see the orange one is not there. So it does not have all the epitopes, although it has the right number of antigens just like this, but it is missing in the epitopes. So these are the two most, this is known as partial D because it's, it has only partial epitopes. So partial D and weak D are the most commonly found D variants. Partial D variants lack one or more epitopes of the D antigen. And it can produce, obviously the human, the body will not recognize that as a own antigen. So it will produce anti allo antibodies directed against one or more of the missing epitopes. And so they will behave like RH negative and they should receive anti-D. Whereas the weak D will not recognize any of these as a foreign and therefore they will behave like an RH positive. But when you're blood typing, you might mistake them for a RH negative. So the report may come wrong. So weak D or also which was known earlier as DU have all the epitopes present but express a reduced amount of D antigen per red blood cell and they may be typed as RH negative in the blood bank. They are identified, if you are suspecting it, then you have to do the indirect antiglobin test. Okay, so here you can see that uh, because there are less number of antigens on surface, the clumping which happens here is not happening. And you may have to add anti-D, coat all of them with anti-D and then use the antiglobin and then you'll be able to identify. Then there are some other red cell antigens which can also cause a problem just like the RH antigen and they are Kel, Kid, Duffy, C, E, then there is M, N, and there are a number of them. There are almost some 50 antigens like this, but they are not very immunogenic. So we don't have to bother about them, except for Kel, which we will come to later on. You have to also ask in every patient whether she has had a history of transfusions. 
So even if the cross matching was done in the blood bank and she has had transfusions, there may be some minor blood group incompatibilities which were not recognized and hence she has got sensitized. And this happens in patients, especially those who have had, they, they will generally give you a, a, a history of having a road accident or of some massive transfusion and then they are the ones who have problems. So just looking at the variants again, partial D may be typed as RH positive. All the epitopes are not present. It makes anti-D and should be treated as RH negative. So for partial, you have to give anti-D. And for weak, it is typed as RH negative. All epitopes are present, but they are not recognized because they are weak. Will not make anti-D. So you, you have to treat us as, as RH positive. You don't have to give anti-D, but if they give, if you they donate blood to an RH negative recipient because they have some antigens, they will cause a reaction. So it is important to recognize that. So this was a little bit about it. I think we already discussed this, that you can have an RH negative baby, even if the parents are RH positive. Both parents are RH negative. Can the baby be RH positive? It cannot be, but again, if we have not wrongly typed them as negative, if they are weak D or partial D, then it is possible that the baby can be RH positive. So I think we talked about this pathophysiology, uh, extramedullary red cell synthesis, hepatomegaly, hypoproteinemia, portal hypertension, ascites, edema, placentomegaly, polyhydramnia, pericardial effusion. Okay. Now, what are the problems which happen in the baby, in the milder cases? If it is not a hydrops or stillbirth, then there will be hepatosplenomegaly, neonatal jaundice. Now, this jaundice typically happens within the first 24 hours. So the they have to start the treatment immediately because the antibodies are already there in the bloodstream. They start attacking the RBCs. And up till now, the mother was clearing the bilirubin, but as soon as the cord is clamped, the baby is going to rapidly become jaundiced. So within 24 hours is RH or other such alloimmunization. Now complications of neonatal connectors, you can see the baby is hypertonic and it is completely turned in this fashion. Lethargy, hypertonicity, hearing loss, cerebral palsy and learning disability. So it's a very important cause of morbidity in the baby, even if the baby survives. And we have to be very careful, even in the NICU, that we do not allow the bilirubin levels to go up. It can also cause neonatal anemia, which will manifest a little later on. We will talk about that. So history, which you must ask the patient, if the patient comes as a BOH case or a reproductive losses, is the worsening obstetric history. Just like you have an improving obstetric history in syphilis, you have worsening obstetric history, then it is RH. So first one may be FKND with no problems, then there will be a mild neonatal jaundice, then there will be hydrops fetalis in the next pregnancy, then term IUFD, and then the IUFD will start, start happening earlier and earlier. So when these people come to us, then at least 10 weeks before the last IUFD, one can expect problems to start. So earlier when we used to do invasive procedures, we used to do the first amniocentesis 10 weeks before the last IUFD. Now, a little bit about prevention. Why do we need to prevent RH isoimmunization? Because as we saw, it's an important cause of fetal death and handicap. There's a progressively worsening outcome with every pregnancy. Treatment is very expensive and only available in specialized centers. And I think we went over this, that the... Uh, Risk of immunization is proportional to the RBC volume and may vary from 3% to 65% depending on the volume. Luckily for us, a majority of the patients have less than 4 ml of ketometanol hemorrhage, which can be cleared by 100 micrograms of RH immunoglobulin. And that is the reason why in the UK, they give 100 micrograms. They try to conserve the injection. So they give 100 micrograms and then they do the Clyhar wet k test and they give additional doses only to, to the people who require. Postpartum prophylaxis can reduce the risk of isoimmunization from 16% to 1%. And if you need to give a single injection, this is the one which you have to give. Uh, so it is mandatory to give anti D300 micrograms if the baby is positive. It should be given as soon as possible and up to within 10 days, you can have some benefit. Now, to reduce this 1%, which happens due to silent ketometanol hemorrhages, we have to give antenatal prophylaxis. Now, prior to 28 weeks, this was a question which was asked to you. Uh, the incidence is only 0.15%. So, overall, the incidence is about 
of fetal maternal hemorrhages is about one to three per thousand. And what Dr. Manohar was telling you that majority is in, at term and, you know, it was not that 45% happens in pregnancy. It was 45% of these bleeds, the incidence of which is one to three per thousand in people who don't have any complication, no symptoms in pregnancy. Of course, if they've had problems, which we discussed all sensitizing events, then the chances will be higher. Antenatal anti-D can reduce the incidence of sensitization to almost 0.2 or 0.3%, which is negligible. And therefore, this uh, guideline of giving antenatal prophylaxis has started. Now, uh, looking at anti-D globulin, it's very safe for the mother and fetus. It produces a titer of 1 is to 2 to 1 is to 4, not more than that. So no problem with monitoring. Half-life of anti-D is 24 days. A single dose of 300 microgram at 28 weeks will last for 12 weeks. And that is why it's given at 28 weeks. Risk of viral infection is in polyclonal uh, anti uh, globulin is estimated to be 1 in 10,000 billion doses. So it's very, very rare. Allergy is also very, very rare. Now, depending on the pregnancy complication, we have to give the dose of IG, uh, RHIG. Uh, it is said that for threatened abortion, where there is just a little bit of spotting, but no pain, you need not give below 13 weeks, you need not give a dose. But again, they have mentioned that if there is repeated and heavy bleeding or if there is pain, then you must give it. First trimester, about everything in the first trimester is 50 micrograms or if that is not available, then 100 micrograms. Second trimester abortion, et cetera, and onwards is 300 micrograms. And if you're expecting that it might be a very massive hemorrhage, it is always better to do the Clyhauer BetK test, which is done 72 hours after giving this. So three days after giving this, you can check do the Clyhauer bed kit test and that will tell you how many are remaining in the circulation and accordingly you calculate and give the additional dose. If you want to check immediately after the mother has delivered uh, whether the fetal maternal hemorrhage, how much has occurred, that is also possible. But then if you are, you know, if you are already knowing that this is a RH positive uh, baby or if they give you the report very fast, but then there has to be a time of about half an hour to 45 minutes before you collect her blood because the, that is the time which the RBCs, the fetal RBCs will take to disperse in the maternal circulation. But a better way is to just give the 300 dose and if you're suspecting something more, then after three days, you again recheck and you can give the additional dose. When is anti-D not required? If you're doing a solely medical management of first trimester MTP miscarriage or ectopic pregnancy, there's a little bit of dispute. The uh, RCOG says this, but uh, if you look at the British Hematological Society and all, they feel that it should be given. So we feel that when in doubt, you give it. Patient with threatened miscarriage, complete miscarriage or pregnancy of unknown location. Patient already sensitized. This is very important. A lot of people, when the patient is sensitized, just keep giving anti-D and that's a waste of resources. So there's, it's no use giving it when once the patient is sensitized. RH negative baby, weak DU or DU blood group in the mother. Now, we had done a, a study where we compared Clyhauer BetK with flow cytometry. Flow cytometry is available in NIIH and it is a very sensitive technique. So, we found that we wanted to know because this is an expensive equipment. So, we wanted to know how good Clyhauer BetK is. And we did a study in uh, these 19 patients and we found that in four of them, there was more hemorrhage, out of which three of them, one was a cesarean section, one was twins, and one was a forceps delivery. And we found that there was a discrepancy. So only when there is massive hemorrhage, then flow cytometry may be useful. Otherwise, Clyhauer bed K test, which can be done by the pathologist very easily in the lab, that is uh, all right. Only problem is that we have to sensitize our pathologists and ask them to do this test for us. So basically here, you just take a small amount of blood in EDTA, 2 to 3 ml of blood in EDTA, make a slide preparation, uh, fix it, and then dip it in CPD, citrate phosphate. And then it is stained with hematoxylin and counter stained with erythrocin. And in this process, we find that, as we discussed, the pink cells will be the resistant cells and they will be seen on the Film. So it's not at all a difficult technique. We have to teach the uh, lab people to do it for us. If we ask for it, they will start doing it. A large fetal maternal hemorrhage is seen in traumatic deliveries, including cesarean section. 
manual removal of the placenta, intrauterine death, abdominal trauma, and twin delivery. An additional anti D25 micrograms for every 1 ml of fetal RBC should be given. Now, I was just wondering whether students could respond to this. I don't know how they can respond to it. Should we give anti D on a patient who is going to undergo tubal ligation? So, in women undergoing tubal ligation, these are the guidelines. Anti D prophylaxis must be given. It's important if the woman chooses to have another pregnancy, ligation fails, or she requires future cross-matching of blood products. When to give anti-D in cases of medical methods of termination? So do we give it at the time of mifepristone or do we give it at the time of mesoprostol? So the guideline for this is that 50 microgram anti-D or 100, which is available, should be given along with mifepristone administration on day one. What to do in cases of recurring bleeding between 20 and 12 to 20 weeks? D negative women presenting with continuous uterine bleeding between 12 to 20 weeks should be given at least 250. Now, international units is five times of the uh, micrograms. Anti D, Ig at a minimum. So, you go on repeating it at six weeks. So, you have sometimes these patients who have low lying placenta and who are continuously bleeding and you are conserving them. So you may need to repeat it at six weekly intervals. If you have given anti-D at 28 weeks in a case of placenta previa and she has a bout of bleeding at 31 weeks, should the dose be repeated? So we discussed that it lasts for 12 weeks, but the guideline is that a minimum of 500 international units, that means 100 micrograms should be administered within 72 hours for any potentially sensitizing events, regardless of whether the woman has already received it. And each new sensitizing event should be managed with an appropriate initial dose of anti-D regardless, regardless of the timing of the dose of the anti-D administered for a previous event. Fetomaternal hemorrhage should be calculated and repeated 72 hours after giving anti-D. Now suppose you gave the patient anti-D at 12 weeks for a sensitizing event, should you repeat the dose at 28 weeks? Yes. So all the guidelines say yes, yes, yes. You have to just go on giving it. Uh, and these are the British Hematological Society guidelines. What about molar pregnancy? Now, molar pregnancy, both RCOG and British Blood Transfusion Society say that it should be given. Uh, the reason is also partly that you can never be sure that this is not a partial mole. And secondly, the histopathology will take time to come. You're not going to waste any time. So that's why we give it for molar pregnancy. Now, monoclonal antibodies. Why did monoclonal antibodies come about? Polyclonal was taken from donors who were hyperimmunized. Uh, often they were males and they were hyperimmunized and then it was taken. But they represented all the epitopes which are there in the population. But it was very difficult to maintain this pool of donors and to get regular donors for it. So monoclonal was manufactured by, with different cell lines. And so far, 19 different recombinant antibodies have been produced by different cell lines and tested in humans. But they may not necessarily match the epitopes, as I told you, which are there in the population. And that is the problem with monoclonal antibodies. Okay, and uh, this we talked about. So you can see here that monoclonal, this is the antibody now. And it does not have the capacity to attach itself to some of the epitopes. So it's not going to be very effective, whereas polyclonal different types are there which will attach to different antigens and it will completely cover this and not allow the patient to get sensitized. Now, a little bit about fetal RH group determination. So if you are able to tell, now because we have now a shortage of these uh, injections and we are trying to conserve the injection. So one way of it would be not to immunize antenatally the women who are carrying an RH negative fetus. So if the husband is uh, heterozygous or you don't even need to test it, you can straight away do like in the UK, if you are identifying the RH negative fetus, you will avoid unnecessary antenatal treatment with anti-D immunoglobulin in about 40% of RH negative women who are carrying an RH negative fetus. And it would eliminate the need to mon keep on monitoring them by color Doppler and treat the pregnancy intensively and carry out any invasive procedures in case you have a doubt. So fetal uh, D-typing has become the standard of care. It is like NIPT, 
they just do the detyping from the peripheral blood in the mother and uh, they are able to conserve their resources. So this is just a very, very old example. Before we had color Doppler, we had this patient and in those days we used to do every month we would do the titer and then we would do amniocentesis at every month, at uh, every two weeks. So we can see in her, uh, I've not written the titer here, but I think the titer was very high. Yeah, it's here. 1024. And she had probably several losses also. So we went on doing the amniocentesis and we found that except for this value, which has gone up, it is more or less steady. So this is a value of the delta OD50. That is what a delta OD450. That means the when you do spectrophotometry and you plot it on this curve, there's a little where there is absorption of bilirubin at 450 nanometers, there's a difference in the uh, absorption. And that difference is the delta OD, delta optical density, difference in optical density, which is measured by the spectrophotometer. That is the value which is plotted here. It was steady. So we decided instead of going on doing amniocentesis every week, we'll do a cordocentesis and it was found to confirm that the blood group was B negative. Now we don't have to do all this because we have color doctor. So other red cell antigens, uh, there's usually a history of transfusion. So only significant one is KEL because here there is also a bone marrow suppression. So anemia is out of proportion to the amniotic fluid picture. Of course, here again, now we have almost practically stopped doing amniocentesis to know the severity of the anemia, but that was the significance of it. So when the patient comes to you, what all will you do? You do the ABORH typing husband's blood group determination and RH antibody titers, which we are showing as a ratio, but abroad they do it as a con concentration in international units per ml. Then the RH antibody titers, if it if at all they are positive, that means the patient is immunized. One is to two, maybe due to anti-D, critical titer as we discussed is important. Anti-D titer in Wadia Hospital was studied in about 500 patients and it was found that 1 is to 16 was associated with mild disease and 1 is to 64 was associated with severe disease. They also analyzed some of the subtypes and they found that certain subtypes are important for severe uh, picture, but this is not important in clinical practice. This is all for research. What is the role of ultrasound? Now, ultrasound is the most important investigation for detection, monitoring of these patients and also for treatment. So the very first thing you need to do is to have an accurate gestational age uh, estimation in the first trimester by the crown rump length. Because all the future charts which you're going to use, it depends on the plotting it on the chart at the right gestational age. Otherwise, you will not be able to take your decisions. Early detection of fetal hydrops can be done by ultrasound, even if your titers have come false negative. Color Doppler detection of fetal anemia can be done early and all the interventions are ultrasound guided. So ultrasound is very, very important. Now, suppose you have a case of mild isoimmunization, below critical titer, then we do a MCA PSV every three to four weeks. We do the monthly and RH antibody titers, deliver at term if stable. We have to keep O negative blood ready. As we discussed, she should not be anemic. We have already taken precautions for that immediate clamping, long cord, and no methogen. Now, how do we detect early the fetal hydrops in these cases? You can see minimal ascites. This minimal ascites was described by a lady sonologist, Bena Saraf, in the US. And she said it looks like a railroad when there is minimal fluid between the bowel loops. So the adjacent walls of the bowel loops and the little fluid in between was known as a railroad sign. Pericardial effusion, if it's more than two millimeters, hepatomegaly, usually more than five centimeters, splenomegaly, three to four times of normal, enlargement of intrahepatic portal vein, more than five millimeters, because the, as we discussed, the, there is portal hypertension. But mind you, as the liver starts enlarging more and more, it again compresses the intrahepatic portal vein. So then it may become thin. So you have to be aware of that. Placental thickness more than 4 centimeters. And late signs will be polyhydramnios. Polyhydramnios is better than oligohydramnios. Oligohydramnios is a very bad sign. So even if the other things are not fitting in, if there is oligohydramnios, I often like to transfuse early. Scalp edema. 
So these are all the signs and we are looking out for all of them, not only just looking at the MCA PSV, but we correlate everything. So this is just to show you the minimal, this is the ring which is seen around the liver, going completely around the liver, then it is fetal hydrox. If you see it only in the anterior part, it is usually the muscles, it has to go all around. Then here you can see severe pleural effusion, ascites, scalp edema. So these are all the various signs. You can see the placenta is very thick. Then as we discussed earlier, Mari et al. in 2000 described the technique of measurement of MCA PSV and the correlation with fetal anemia. You need the fetal. Now you can see the image here. This is exactly what we are looking at. Okay. So these are the anterior cerebral, the middle cerebral. If you put the probe on the lower abdomen, this is exactly perpendicular to your probe. So you will get a zero degree angle. MCA is identified at the anterior wing of the sphenoid bone. Angle of insertion should be close to zero. A two millimeter gate should be used and pulse Doppler gate should be placed at the origin, just where it emerges. So this is one of our patients where we have measured. Peak systolic velocity of the blood flowing through a vessel depends on viscosity and cardiac output. So these were the two things which we discussed. Increased PSV is seen in anemia. PSV more than 1.5 moms indicates moderate to severe fetal anemia. So you have to go in and transfuse the baby. Now the older methods which we used to follow, we used to earlier say that indications for intrauterine transfusion are amniotic fluid OD 415 lies upper zone 2 or 3. Okay, so there were three zones and the middle zone was divided into upper and lower. So either upper part of zone two or zone three or a sudden rise, ultrasound evidence of hydrox or we used to do chordocentesis, which as I mentioned to you, we used to do 10 weeks before the earlier loss. And if the hemoglobin was lower than fifth percentile for gestational age, which means less than 25% below 25 weeks and more, less than 30% above 26 weeks, then we used to transfuse. But now this is completely replaced by this nomogram, which is uh, by Mari et al., which shows that once you plot the gestational age and the MCA peak velocity, it gets divided into four zones. Zone D is absolutely safe. Baby is not at all anemic. You can repeat it in two or three weeks, the color Doppler. In zone C, we repeat in seven to 10 days. Now we start getting worried when it goes to zone B because we have to start planning the transfusion and believe me, it's not easy to plan everything and carry out the transfusion. I hate to do it when the patient is already in zone A because we are not getting the blood, we are not getting this and that. So it's, we'll, what we do is when they start going to upper end of zone B, we start looking for the blood and admit them and we start preparing so that we get a good outcome. And A means you have to transfuse. Now, amniocentesis, which is outdated, this is the graph, Lylees. Now, why is this going down like this and the other one is going upwards? That is because naturally the MCA peak systolic velocity because of the cardiac output and all that, it increases across gestation. Whereas bilirubin levels decrease across gestation. So, this is the, these are sort of the centiles which have been used. So, Lylee's zones were described only from 27 weeks up to term. Now, we are more interested even in the earlier part. So, in the earlier part, we our babies now uh, can be salvaged at 27, 28 weeks. So, there's nothing before that. Okay, that was the problem. Plus, it was an invasive procedure. So, we are not using this anymore. Now, this is just to show you when we got the uh, color Doppler machine in 1998 and we started using it. First, we were very suspicious. We used to do both the things, amniocentesis as well as color Doppler because we never believed it. But what impact it had from 1994 to 2001, you can see the number of patients who underwent all these procedures, 161 amniocentesis. So procedures per patient, almost five procedures per patient. Whereas after we switched completely to color Doppler, each patient will undergo two or three procedures and amniocentesis very rarely. So this was a remarkable difference because as you know, once you do multiple procedures, there is always a chance, especially in a patient who has polyhydramnios already, that she may go into preterm labor. You want to help her, but she just delivers before you can help her. Severe RH isoimmunization is 
patients will come with a history of previously affected babies or losses, high RH rising antibody titers, they can rise very rapidly. MCA PSV raised early, minimal hydrox, or they will have vicious sensitization. That means last time in the last pregnancy, it was just 1 is to 16, and now this time it has suddenly jumped to 1 is 512. That is known as vicious sensitization. So, what is the aim of treatment of these uh, mothers? Minimum intervention at the optimal time, and an aim is to deliver as close to term as possible. Now, Abraham Lincoln had famously said, if I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend six hours sharpening my axe. So the preparation for the IUT is very important. O negative, CMV negative, washed, irradiated, double packed cells, cross-matched against the maternal blood, less than five days old. CPD buffer, now nowadays, all the blood banks are collecting in sagam. So you cannot just take it from a blood bank. You have to plan, you have to get the donor, you have to get the donor. After he donates, it, testing takes one day and then you get the blood in hand. So there's a lot of preparation and you have to start well in advance. So trolley is very simple. You have a muscle relaxant for the baby, either pancuronium or vecuronium. Vecuronium is given intravenously, so it can be given only in those cases where you're going to directly enter the cord. Cord is anteriorly placed. Still, I prefer pancuronium because I like to paralyze the baby first, otherwise it starts kicking just when you're putting the needle inside. You require a spinal needle, 18 and 20. 18 for the transfusion because we are using double packed cells with which is the blood is very, <laughs> very viscous and it will not go uh, through a thin needle. And this needle is used for giving the pancuronium to the baby. You just require a blood transfusion set, several... Uh, syringes and needles and this very important thing which is a uh, it's just an extension tubing but this should fit both the ends properly otherwise it creates trouble for us. So you have to visualize the cord insertion very well. You can see here that this is a posterior cord insertion. You can see the one artery and the second artery and this thin walled broad structure is the vein which is our target. And you can see over here this is a very old uh, uh, picture we're showing a very old-fashioned uh, ultrasound machine but we are doing the transfusion over here so what are the sites of transfusion the best site of transfusion is the placental end of the cord you can also give it in the intrahepatic vein but as you can see uh, i will show you that some of them get cholestatic jaundice when we give it so when we first started doing an intrahepatic vein, we were very happy because, you know, a little movement of the needle also, you're not very much worried. Uh, in placental end of cord, when the mother is breathing, the whole abdomen is moving one or two millimeters. If your needle slips out, you can have a problem. Here it is supported by the liver. But we found that some of the babies were getting alarming levels of cholestatic jaundice, which was absolutely benign, but it was very worrisome when the baby's bilirubin would shoot up. So we use it only when we are not able to give at the placental end of the cord. We can always give an intraperitoneal transfusion. If I find a lot of difficulty in giving an intravascular transfusion and because I have posted the patient early at the upper end of zone B or just at the A, beginning of A, I have time in my hand. I will not pursue poking the cord again and again because it can lead to an intrauterine fetal death. I would rather put it in the peritoneum and I will find that it is absorbed in the next 48 hours or 72 hours. Free loop of cord will go on moving. So it is difficult to give it in the free loop of cord. But if there is severe oligohydramnios, you can give it in the free loop of cord. Fetal end, I never prefer for some reason. I always feel that over there it is very unsupported. Intracardiac, I have given once or twice in desperate situations. And the, because there was a hematoma at the placental end of the cord and the baby has survived and gone home. Types of transfusion are intravascular, intraperitoneal, or combined. Now, intravascular is technically difficult, but the advantage is that the baby's hemoglobin will be immediately elevated, and you can get a post-transfusion sample. So you can check how much the, uh, the hemoglobin has come up. Intraperitoneal transfusion is ineffective in hydropic fetuses because it relies on the negative intra-abdominal pressure, which will suck the RBCs from the peritoneum into the vascular system. So once the hydrox occurs, you can't do this. This is another reason why you should go in a little bit earlier before the patient deteriorates. Indications for intraperitoneal transfusion could be an inaccessible cord insertion. 
believe me, if the patient comes at 32, 34 weeks, it's a posterior placenta, the cord insertion is completely behind the baby. You just cannot reach it. So there you may give either intrahepatic or you can give intraperitoneal. Velamentous cord insertion. Here you are worried about a cord hematoma. It is not supported. Cord hematoma thrombosis has occurred or failed attempts at intravascular transfusion. Don't go on pursuing. You can give intraperitoneal transfusion. Wait for a few days and then once the baby is again little better shape, liker has improved, then you attempt intravascular transfusion. If you give, Nicolini had described intraperitoneal along with intravascular transfusion and the advantage of this is that the hemoglobin is immediately brought up to normal levels and this within the next week, the intraperitoneal blood is absorbed so that you can prolong the interval between the transfusions. So this is very good for severely sensitized mothers. Now, this is a subgroup analysis which my uh, registrar had done. And you can see that intra-umbilical was the most popular site. Intraperitoneal was next and intrahepatic. These were about equal. Now, how much to transfuse? There is this uh, nomogram which is described by Nicolaidis. It depends on the volume of the fetoplacental blood volume of the fetus, which is related to the gestational age. So first we look, for example, if we are doing the transfusion at 30 weeks, we drop a perpendicular and see the fetoplacental blood volume will be about 125, 130. So we know this and then we know the donor hematocrit which the blood bank has given us. Suppose it is 70. It's usually between 70 and 80 because it is double packed. So what we do is we uh, flush the 18 number needle with heparin and we introduce the 18 number needle into the cord and we aspirate about two cc's of the fetal blood and we immediately send it for the hematocrit which comes back in a couple of minutes and we can see that Suppose the hemoglobin, as we said, 25% is the usual hematocrit at which we transfuse. So we can find out this is a factor of 0.6. So we will have to multiply 130 into 0.6 and that will be the volume roughly about 100 ml which we will transfuse. And this has stood in good stead over the years. I find it very accurate even though there are many other calculators which are available on the internet now. So we do it in the traditional way. Intraperitoneal, the, in the intraperitoneal transfusion, the volume is every 10 ml for weeks of gestation above 20. The transfusion is done slowly at 3 to 5 ml per minute in an intraperitoneal transfusion until the calculated volume of blood is transfused. Aim is to achieve a hematocrit of 40 to 45 percent at the end of the transfusion. For combined transfusion, we give a little less in the intravascular so that because this is, we know that this is going to be absorbed over the next week. Over transfusion can lead to IUFD and hyperviscosity syndrome. So we don't want to over transfuse the baby. We just want a little more gap between the transfusions. So now this is, uh, you can see over here, it's a short clip, but I'll show you. You can see this is the needle which is being advanced. This is the cord insertion here. This is, this is where the needle tip is, okay? You can see the needle tip over here. And here is, you see the cascade. You see the blood going in the form of a waterfall or a cascade. You can see it is going in the vein, which is this big thin-walled big vessel, which is the vein. So that is how it looks. And we keep watching it continuously throughout the transfusion. We never take our eyes off that. Now, this is an intraperitoneal transfusion. You can see the needle. This is the liver with the blood vessels. So just below the liver, the tip is there and we will start transfusing. Now, this was an interesting case with oligohydramnios. And you can see that there is a cord insertion over here, but it was difficult to reach that at a convenient angle. But what we found was that the cord was around the neck of the baby. And the baby was hardly moving because of the oligohydramnios. So what we did was... You can see the needle is going in here, advancing towards the cord. This is the cord round neck. And you can see over here, it's not a very good video, but you can see some movement of the blood. So we gave the transfusion, see that, in the cord around the neck. So it was a very unusual case and this baby did well. So how do you time the transfusions? So you go on plotting on the graph. You can see over here, this 
patient was transfused in zone B because she had a lot of losses. So we in those days, we were not, it's very long back, because we were not sure of everything. So in zone B, we arranged the blood. Once we transfused, we saw that it has dropped now. And then gradually it increased. This was done at about, say, 28 weeks. And then in two weeks, we found that it shot up. So again, we gave the second transfusion. And as you give subsequent transfusions, it suppresses the bone marrow of the baby. So then the interval between the transfusions goes on increasing. So because of this, we were able to deliver the baby at 35 weeks. The timing of repeat transfusion, older method was that we used to assume that there's a fall in the post-transfusion hematocrit at the rate of 1% per day. And then we used to repeat the transfusion when we felt that it has reached 25%. But now since we have MCA PSV, we have a very accurate way of determining that the baby has become anemic if it exceeds 1.5 moms. But now the concern was that after the first transfusion, is it going to be useful? Because of adult RBCs are now occupying the baby's circulation, there's increased rigidity of these RBCs, raised fetal hematocrit, decreased oxygen delivery. So all these factors, what will they do to the blood flow through the middle cerebral artery? Increased blood viscosity and reduced PSD. So uh, a modified threshold was described of 1.3 moms to detect moderate or severe anemia after the second transfusion. So we also studied this in Wadia Hospital. We took 44 uh, MCA PSV values in 15 patients, provided the hemoglobin level was done by chordocentesis within five days of the measurement. So we selected these patients and we found that 22 patients had moderate and severe anemia. And out of these, 18 of them had MCA PSV more than 1.2 moms. So 81% of them could be detected by using a cutoff of 1.2 moms. To cut it short, basically for subsequent transfusions, we will, we will try to intervene a bit earlier. We will not wait for it to go into zone A. Timing the later transfusions, after 35 weeks, MCA PSV is not reliable. So we generally don't do last transfusion after 35 weeks. We would rather give steroids and deliver the baby. Uh, the drop of uh, hemoglobin is 0.4 grams per deciliter per day. So we saw that it was 1% hematocrit. So that is the same as this. Uh, 0.3 grams after the second transmission, 0.2 grams. So it, it starts dropping slower and slower because of the bone marrow suppression. Now in all this, we are so much worried about MCA Doppler and all that. We must not forget that the patient has to keep her kick count we must do the NSTs, serial tests for well-being. Remember to give the steroids, especially if you feel that she may require an earlier delivery. Nowadays, we try to estimate when we are delivering and give steroids within 15 days, not more than 15 days earlier. So that is your judgment. But if you feel there's a lot of polyhydramnia, she might suddenly get leaking in the middle of the night. It is better to give her steroids. After 30 weeks, the facilities for LSCS should also be there. In case there's some bradycardia or something during transmission, you can still deliver and salvage the baby. But how late to deliver? There's a tendency because of the improved NICU care that 32 weeks let us deliver, 34 weeks let us deliver. But I was looking at these papers where uh, they found, they analyzed almost 2 lakh births as per the gestational age. And it is in a pediatric uh, neurological study in uh, in Journal of Clinical Medicine. So they looked at the long-term pediatric neurological hospitalizations and cerebral palsy. So you can see that moderate to late preterm, which was uh, 34 to 36 weeks. Still, there is a two and a half times risk of cerebral palsy as compared to term gestation. So our aim will still be to go at least up to 37 weeks even if it requires a large number of transfusions. So this was a very landmark case very early on. Now this girl is almost 22 years old and she's very bright. So this is the first transfusion in desperation, which we did at the time. She could not afford IV immunoglobulins. And we thought that let us just put in, the husband was homozygous. So we thought let us just put in the peritoneal cavity. We put eight cc's of packed cells in the peritoneal cavity at 15 weeks. And we found that because her last loss had happened at 18 to 20 weeks. Uh, I don't know if Karthik is listening. Karthik, you had referred one patient to me. And we were just before this. 
and we were going to take her up at 18 to 20 weeks as usual and around 16 17 weeks she got an iufd with hydrox so when this patient came to me i thought that we cannot just wait and we put in at 15 weeks this was before the revival of intraperitoneal transfusion which came in british journal subsequently because intraperitoneal transfusion had been completely stopped in between and it really helped her because we could pull on till 20 weeks then we gave her multiple transfusions and then we were able to deliver she had large number of losses five six losses so here you can see this video yeah so this is how this is a very early gestation and you can see the needle has gone in the peritoneal cavity and you can see this will start becoming black now all the blood accumulating over there that is how we give and this female baby of 2.2 kg was delivered at 33.2 uh, weeks and she did not require any exchange transfusion at any stage so this was 20 years back and we were so much encouraged by this you know we thought we can really do a very good job even in the severely isoimmunized cases now what is the role of iv immunoglobulin iv immunoglobulin has been described in a dose of 0 0.4 gram per kg per day for 5 days and this is this can lower the it not exactly lower the titers if you measure the titers the titers may not go down but it will coat the rbcs and it will protect them from the effects of the antibodies and these, uh, they found that there was a much less mortality. The only problem is that it is extremely expensive. So the Indian experience in All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Dr. Deepika Deka did, and she used much lower doses and she found that that is also helpful. So what we do is we just ask the patient how much they can afford and whatever they can afford, we give it. So we say 15,000, 20,000, whatever you can afford because they are very severely sensitized and we feel that they may go into hydrox even before we can give the first transfusion. So for such people, or somewhere, sometimes when it's a very precious pregnancy, IVF pregnancy and all that, we don't want to take a chance. So we give them whatever they can afford and that also prolongs the uh, affection of the baby by about three, four weeks at least. Okay. So this is our series uh, between 2001 and 22. Uh, 251 transfusions and we had almost a 90% survival. Uh, to analyze this, this subgroup analysis which was done by my registrar, uh, to just look at the hydrox survivals, the patients who came especially early in pregnancy with severe hydrox, it's very difficult to salvage them. They have uh, complete anasarca, there is polyhydramnios, there's a big placenta and what happens in these patients who come with hydrops is we don't give the fully calculated dose because the baby cannot tolerate it. The heart is already in failure. It cannot tolerate that excess dose. So we give only 50% of the dose and after 48 hours, we give 50%. So very often what happens is that these people, after that first transfusion, they go into preterm labor or they get leaking. So it's very difficult to treat the ones who come with severe hydrops at an early stage. Because it is said that even the hypoxia causes some kind of vascular damage and then there is an increased permeability of all the blood vessels and the hydrox does not reverse very well. Looking at the neonatal course, neonatal jaundice was the most common complication. And uh, however, it could be taken care of by IVIG. They give IVIG to the baby also, phototherapy. Very few people got uh, required exchange transfusions. And you can see that the majority of the babies were out of the NICU in about a week or so. Now, care after discharge is very, very important. We did not realize this initially when we enthusiastically started transfusing all the babies. We found that one or two babies after one or two months after going home, they suddenly died. They had a sudden infant death. And then we realized that the bone marrow suppression which occurs, it aggravates the normal physiological anemia which happens at three months of age. So every 15 days, they must do their hemoglobin. We send, usually send them with a note to the nearest medical college hospital, wherever they come from, and that they should keep on repeating this. And they can just be given a small top-up transfusion. Or if they are refractory, then they are given erythropoietin. And after three months, this completely goes away. There are many investigative therapies which are described. Plasma pheresis, plasma exchange. You can read about it. Uh, Finargan is supposed to suppress the immunity, but difficult to give it throughout pregnancy. Oral erythrocyte membranes to prevent the sensitization. Maternal marrow stem cell transfusion. So these are very complicated. 
and uh, the counseling which is required they have to be told about a lot of complications so when they hear about it they usually come back and say that we will go for the traditional techniques and fetal ivig is very promising but there are a lot of problems in getting the ethics committee permission for this but if you do a transfusion and you inject a small amount of immunoglobulin into the baby it will really prolong the interval between the transfusions what is the long term neurological outcome of these babies there was a lotus study which was done where 291 children were evaluated until 8 years of age and the neurodevelopmental impairment was about 5% less than 5% severe hydrops was independently associated with neurodevelopmental impairment so the message again and again and again is that they should be referred early not wait till hydrops occurs because they will have more losses and they will have neurodevelopmental delay now this is just to show you how the trends have changed after the color doppler and all came we had taken out the data from 1994 to 2001 before we started doing dopplers and we are roughly about 5% of the population is 5 to 10% is rh negative iso immunized is 104 so we used to do so many procedures and the survival was 60% now it is nearly 90% this was published uh, in, in uh, journal of prenatal diagnosis and therapy in 2010 so the take home message is prevention of fetal hydrops the strongest pre operative predictor for impaired neurodevelopment delay by timely detection referral and treatment may improve the long term outcome thank you very much for a patient hearing if you have any questions i am happy to answer yeah purnima how do i express my thanks to you it's one of the most comprehensive talks on rh you covered the entire i don't think no single book or anything can cover so much excellent no doubt you are the most sought after fetal medicine expert in the country when it comes to No, no. I'm not in the country. Purnima, I'm telling you, no, no. I'm not. I see. I never try to mince words. The reason is the amount of work you put on on this topic and on this subject in the last twenty twenty five years. It's commendable because you are so dedicated to this entire subject, and it is seen for all of us to see the kind of uh, data you have given us. We are we are very proud that Mumbai is on the map with Wadia doing so much of good work for these babies. excellent ran and if you would like to thank you from the heart for being with us today morning will be hope you can continue a little longer but in case you have any commitments no problem at all thank you so very much on behalf of the president nilima masudkar kartik myself dr saraugi again i say no words are enough to thank you so very much and i hope you don't mind in case we travel for the students when you are free because we need need teachers like you to pass on these messages to the students we want thank the you knowledge so much. knowledge to percolate down so this is the attempt we take so we hope you are a part of us and you continue to be a part of us please. thank you so thank very thank you much. for your appreciation and thanks to dr sarogi dr mohan gadam karthik yeah. you all of you for inviting me i want to thank my team because they are the most important people when yeah. i do all these transfusions and we have now two fellowship programs in wadia hospital because the students are listening i am telling them we have the muhs fellowship for which we take in two fellows and hopefully now if geeta becomes a teacher then three fellows will come every year but we also have an institutional fellowship of 6 months which is more popular because people have to leave their practice and come and there is a very good workload every day they see about 8 to 10 very interesting anomalies they do autopsies and so there's a wow. lot of good work going on which i would like uh, the younger generation to take advantage of so wadia rocks even now good uh well friends let's go to the second part of the program it been a very very informative morning i think clarinet may have this presentation on the application so those of you who have missed it don't worry such such treasure of knowledge will be available to you now we have this second presenter of the day we are discussing nausea and vomiting in pre preg pregnancy followed by the gi disorders we have in pregnancy we have a case presentation by dr akanksha uh and uh, there was a little misunderstanding between two students but i think we were informed a little late about her so no offense intended to the second girl in case we have time we'll accommodate her so on to and we have our uh, expert today dr sanjeev khanna who's been so very kind friends to be a part of the no no he's not a gynecologist he's a gastroenterologist a very senior gastroenterologist in the city of mumbai and uh, he's been with the km so he's alumni one of the most prestigious institutes of the country and we'll be introducing him in a little detail when we comes to talk on it so now we move on to akanksha to present the case of 
uh, vomiting in pregnancy. Akanksha, relax. We are all very soft people. Go ahead, please. Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Go ahead, Akanksha. Yes. Yeah. your voice is cracking better. Check your net. So, so he will start the... Yeah. Uh, Manohar, can I just come in for a second? Please, please. You're most welcome. You can come on and on and on. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you a lot. Uh, thanks a lot to RAN team and to my great uh, hobby guy and friends, Manohar. Dr. Rajendra Saraugi, whom I'm seeing after a long time, Karthik, mm -hmm. Mohan, and um, uh, just to say that Akanksha is one of our bright students from the Holy Spirit Hospital, and she's a second year DNB resident. And so she's presenting a live case, which she has seen, real life case. And then uh, we'll go ahead and discuss. Um, we'll, let us see out. So Akanksha, all yours. Thank you. Sir, I'll start. Yes, please. Yes, yes, please. yes sir. So, so here there's this 21-year-old female, married since one year, primary gravida 10.2 weeks by date and 10.4 by scan. Came with chief complaints of increased episodes of vomiting and nausea, 10 to 12 episodes of vomiting in a day since one day. Not tolerating any oral intake, vomits each time after any oral intake. Associated with nausea and epigastric discomfort and decreased appetite. Vomiting is non-bilious, non-projectile, yellow in color, contains food particles, blood stain, fresh red color. So you just said non-bilious and you said that it is yellow in color. <clears throat> so are you? is there some mismatch there? What are you trying to say? So <clears throat> bilious vomiting is more of greenish yellow in color, sir. And this is more of food particles which she vomits every time she has any oral intake. Yeah, but yellow and green, Akanksha, there's a very thin line of separation. So let us not uh, quibble on trivialities. Okay. What uh, what what are you really trying? Uh, Manohar, can we can we interrupt the? Yeah yeah please. yeah yeah. You have to you have to. Yeah. yeah. You okay. continue whenever you want to interrupt. You're absolutely welcome. Yeah, yeah. You got so about I, forty-five just, minutes. Yeah. I will just get on to a clinical. Um, you know, uh, understanding first and then we'll take it from there. So, Akanksha, when you say that the vomit is yellow or bilious, let us presume, what are you trying to imply? Uh, so, there, there are multiple causes of vomiting which we need to rule out. So, whenever the vomiting is just bilious and so then can, they, we also have to rule out obstruction because of which the vomit can be just plain bilious and it obstruction will not be... Where? Obstruction where? Uh, sir, obstruction at the upper GI level, sir. Uh, what what exactly do you mean? Where? Can you be a little more precise? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so, sir, uh, like, uh, uh, sir, in the upper GI system, uh, like, uh, related to the stomach, and it's about the level of the junction where the... Uh, Above the level of second half of the ordinum. So, if it is above the level of the second part, uh, it will be bilious? Yes, sir. Okay. Just just relax, Akanksha. Yes. Do you know where the bile duct opens into the duodenum? Don't worry. You are doing well. Be relaxed. Manohar, just encourage her a bit. <laughs> Akanksha, don't worry. We are here just to just relax, man. We are all sitting together and discussing. Just assume we are having coffee next to us. That's all. Go ahead. So, where does the where does the bile duct open in the duodenum? Which part so of the duodenum? I make it easy for you. It opens on the in the second part on the medial aspect of the second part. Okay, and that's called the ampulla of yes, sir. Ampulla of ampulla of beta, sir. Ampula. Beta, okay. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the, the Germans pronounce V as F, 
and that's why it's called ampule of fater. That's why it's called Volkswagen and not Volkswagen. Okay. So, so it's it's ampule of fater. And yeah. So, if there is an obstruction distal to the ampule of fater, then the the bile the the vomit will be yellow in color or bilious. Okay, which means that the bile is entering and okay. then coming back okay. reverse upwards. If the if the obstruction is proximal okay. to the second part, then the then the by and then the vomit is not going to be non bilious. All right, is that clear to everyone? Yes. Okay. Okay, Akanksha, please go ahead. Patient was apparent all right till four. Akanksha, I think you've got a weak internet. No, no, you're audible, but it's cracking. You may have a weak internet. So one option is to shut your video. We may not be able to see you, but be able to hear you. Let's try it without your video because you're cracking. You're cracking. Sir, is now it let's... better now? Definitely. Please go ahead. Okay. So patient was apparently all right till four weeks back when she came for first ANC visit at six weeks of gestation and had chief complaints of four to six episodes of nausea, vomiting. Nausea and vomiting were more in morning and were initially relieved with oral medications, doxylamine 20 mg TDS with ginger tablets and dry bland diet. Okay. I want to know, why do they get vomiting in pregnancy? No, I can't hear you. Please. She's got a net problem, I guess. Can you ask your... Let, your... let her switch off. That will be better. So, one second. I'll just change the connection. Yeah, now you're better. Now you're okay. Come, okay. continue. Okay. Sorry for the disturbance, sir. So, patient was apparently all right till four weeks back when she came for first ANC visit at six weeks of gestation and her chief complaints of only four to six episodes of vomiting with nausea, vomiting which was more in morning, relieved with oral medications and diet, dry bland diet. However, complaints of vomiting increased eight weeks of gestation for which patient visited casualty was given IV fluids and IV medications after which patient was relieved and went home with additional doses of antiemetics. Patient was then symptomatically better. However, since one day patient is not able to tolerate any oral intake, has 10 to 12 episodes of vomiting per day. Vomiting is associated with nausea, epigastric discomfort and is blood stain. Yes, yeah, so that's the answer of Dr. Sarogi's question. Why does vomiting happen in pregnancy? Why does vomiting occur as a normal case in pregnancy? So the, do hyperemesis also occurs in pregnancy? Okay. So, what, so the vomiting in pregnancy, which is... Sir, am I audible? Yeah, go okay. for it. We can hear you in bits and patches, but we'll, we, are, we can understand. Go ahead. So I'm really sorry about it. I've changed the connections. So sorry. So uh, vomiting in pregnancy is usually associated because of the hormonal changes. So, sir, because of there is rise in beta HCG is the main cause for vomiting in pregnancy. But that is mostly simple emesis, emesis gravidarum. But some patients are prone for hyperemesis. That is because they're, because it's, it is multifactorial. Sudden rise, increase in beta HCG in, during the initial first trimester, along with other hormonal causes, increase in estrogen, progesterone, placental lactogen, uh, social vestibular factors. And so also there can be other causes like for hyperemesis. If the patient is hyperthyroid, multiple pregnancies, molar pregnancies, so basically everything boils down to problem is with the placenta rather than with the fetus. Am I right? Yes, sir. So whenever there is double placenta or for example in twins, the placenta may be a little longer, bigger. Placenta is not formed earlier, but the chorionic tissue which is there is responsible. So basically it is the hormones which are responsible for vomiting and that is why you get vomiting in OC pills. Because estrogen is there. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Is, is genetics important in nausea vomiting? 
so yeah genetic plays a role so anyone having family history that mother has been prone to hyperemesis then the patient will have vomit more prone for hyperemesis stress factors social factors you so yes have... so stress factors Psychosocial factor plays a role, so that's why uh, any patient getting admitted with hyperemesis, adequate nursing care is also important. Because uh, the nausea is like a vicious cycle. The patient gets nausea, vomiting, patient gets retching, and patient vomits more and more. Can you describe the normal cycle of nausea, vomiting in pregnancy? A normal patient, onset, peak, and disappearance. Uh, most of the patients yes, have any, uh, nausea vomiting. So what is the normal pattern they follow? Yes, sir. So the nausea vomiting set initially starts at 5 to 6 weeks of gestation. It peaks at around 9 to 10 weeks when the HCG rises high. And then after it settles down by 16 to 20 weeks. How many settle by the 12th week? Uh, uh, so settlement by 12th week, sir, approximately... Sir, 50 to 60 percent of patients. Correct. 60 percent settled by the 12th week. Settled by the end of 16th to. Yeah, so by the time they reach 20th week, 90 percent will settle. The moment they go beyond 20 weeks, you have to scratch your head and find out something wrong. Anything yeah. else, depending Definitely. on the time timing of vomiting in pregnancy, apart from 20 weeks, anything in the first trimester which may make you think that this need not be a nausea vomiting of pregnancy. Something early so in the trimester. When you so said about the peak of ninth week, onset of vomiting after the ninth week, a patient was apparently well in the first eight, nine weeks. We again trigger that there may be a cause other than the usual cause of uh, an NVP, what you call it. So nine weeks okay. is onset and beyond 20 weeks of continuation, we may have to take help Dr. Sanjeev Karna's help for that. Yes, so definitely. <laughs> What, what, hey. doctor, uh, what Dr. Uh, Motwani is trying to ask you, Akanksha, is that is there any other condition which you will also think of? Yes, like sir. You said, like you said, obstruction, which is little, uh, it's not common. Un uncommon. What, what are the common things would, would you, which you would consider in day-to-day -day practice? Yes, sir. So, in day-to-day -day practice, so first we would like to re rule out the other obstetric cause which might be involved. Patient could be hyperthyroid. As I said, so it could be a molar pregnancy. There could be multiple pregnancies. So, beyond this, there could be some medical causes which we need to keep in mind while we are dealing with any patient because hyperemesis, we need to deal it as a diagnosis of exclusion, sir. So, it could be acute gastroenteritis. Sir, it could be hepatitis. Uh, and it could, sir, it could be due to pancreatitis. So then there are other surgical causes which we need to rule out. Could be due to cholecystitis, could, could, uh, could be due to appendicitis. Then, sir, we need to rule out some gynecological causes as well. Ovarian torsion, fibroid degeneration. So where in, in all of these which you have mentioned, Akanksha, what would be the other very important, say for the first two causes, which is day-to-day, -day, gastroenteritis, hepatitis, it, it is right now the flavor of the season, okay? There's a big, yes, uh, yeah, big epidemic almost uh, rampaging through the city. So almost every, you know, uh, society has, has a few cases. So what is that main one symptom which you look for, apart from vomiting? Say, say a patient has hepatitis or a patient has gastroenteritis, what else will you look out for? So that's why so we need to rule, we need to take the negative history, sir, and we need to rule out that the patient does not have history of any outside food consumption. Patient does not have any complaints of fever, patient does not have any complaints of yellowish discoloration of skin or blue stools, blood in stool, pain in abdomen, sir. Good. So so the pain would be a very big factor, and then there could be a history of fever. See, eating yes, eating out is has become the norm. If you don't eat out, then something is wrong with people nowadays, they say. So, yes, you know, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. So, um, even if you are at home, you will order food from out, most people. And then they will, they may not tell you that they are eating from out. Okay. Because they feel that all yes, these home, home delivery apps which are available, they, they are giving you very good food, very healthy food, so called. Okay. So, you have to make yes, sir. Be very clear. And and obviously everything else, cholecystitis, appendicitis, there will be a very strong, what other history apart from vomiting? Uh, so for appendicitis, patient might have history of fever. Patient will have uh, discomfort in the right lower abdomen. 
pain, pain. Okay, cholecystitis, pancreatitis, pancreatitis. The primary presentation is pain and not vomiting. With pain. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, you sir. have to look out for pain as your predominant and the pain pattern will tell you. If I get a patient who gets pain in the mid-abdomen which goes to the back and he's better by bending forward and he has vomiting, I would think of he has had an alcoholic pain binge yeah, a day before. I would think a patient has a right upper quadrant pain which goes to yes, his capital. I would think of a biliary pain, you know. So it's the pain pattern and the, the modalities of the pain which you have to look into. All right. Anything else, Manohar? Uh, Rajendra ji, you want to ask? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I think go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, sir. Go ahead. Yes, sir. So, so then the negative history, when I ask patients the question, the patient has a history of approximately 2 to 2.5 kg weight loss in a matter of one month. History of hard stool, sense of incomplete evacuation since two to three days. However, sir, as I described, no history or chief complaints of fever, pain in abdomen, outside food consumption, blood in stools, loose stools, or any pain elsewhere in the abdomen, sir. Okay. Uh, Sir, so then talking about the menstrual history of the patient, last menstrual date is 26th of May 2023. Expected date of delivery by date is 28th of Feb 2024. Previous menstrual cycles, regular 30-day cycle, moderate flow and mild dysmenorrhea. Obstetric history, patient is a primary gravida, conceived spontaneously, no history of use of any contraception and no history of any congenital anomaly in family. Past history, sir, no associated or known medical illness. However, patient has a surgical illness of lap appendicectomy done five years ago. No known drug or food allergy. So personal history, patient comes from lower middle class, housewife by occupation. Appetite has been decreased and disturbed due to persistent vomiting. Sleep has been disturbed because of frequent episodes of vomiting. Bowel, heart stool, sense of incomplete evacuation since two to three days. And bladder, no complaints. So, I'll go ahead. Yeah. yeah please. Family history. Some mother is hyperthyroid and treatment. Non-consanguineous marriage. No history of any congenital anomaly in family. So, on my general examination, patient weighs 48 kg. Patient looks dehydrated, troubled due to multiple episodes of vomiting. Dry coated tongue. Patient has tachycardia, sir. Pulse is 110. BP 90-60. Respiratory rate 18. Skin togo maintained. Tongue looks dehydrated. Pallor 1+. plus. However, no interest, clubbing, senosis, lymphadenopathy or edema. Sir, basic ECG looks normal. Why did you take an ECG, Akanksha? Sir, because the patient has complaints of severe episodes of vomiting. So, sir, sometimes the patients can have electrolyte imbalance. So, if the patient has severe hypokalemia, so, so that's why we need to do an ECG to rule out any uh, uh, electrolyte imbalance causing ECG changes. Excellent. But why, why don't you just wait for a potassium level? Why, why do you want an ECG? So, we have done the electrolyte levels as well, sir. No. So, but what is the to that question that why do you want uh, an ECG and an electrolyte level because the ECG comes to you instantly yes sir the electrolyte levels are going to take a couple of hours One even minute. the best of places you know yes so, sir and usually they'll take four to six hours so you you, you are always you, as you said very rightly you're concerned about uh, a low potassium and that is so. You're right. What what uh, what would you see on the ECG as the first manifestation of a low potassium? Sir, uh, the patient can have tall T waves. Uh, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I don't expect you to know that, but it's no. it's just the opposite. The T waves get flat. The heart rate oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, heart rate yeah. slows down. The P waves get flat. And you can get a U yeah, wave. Mild but doesn't matter. Doesn't wave. matter. That is for your medical colleagues and cardiac colleagues to help you out on that. Doesn't matter. You're doing well. Go ahead. Thanks. But you did the right thing by taking an ECG. And you should add, you should take a rhythm strip. That means a long lead too should be taken to look out for arrhythmias. Okay. 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 Good. Good. Okay. okay good.
so on systemic examination patient is conscious oriented to time place and persons cardiovascular system s1 s2 heard no murmur rs air entry bilaterally equal on per abdomen examination it is soft no organomegaly no guarding tenderness or rigidity bowel sounds plus per vaginal examination uterus is antiverted 10 week size phonics clear no bleeding do you expect some epigastric tenderness in patients with hyperemesis sir if abdominal the patient pain? sir if the patient has malady we stare or no, further no, 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 no. routine patients after so much of vomiting tend to have vomits in an hour they are bound yes, to have some amount of stretching of the epigastrium they going to have some abdominal pain You have to rule that pain from the pain of some other underlying condition. There are so many vas that he says, "Ikthe duktani goes to the back, right yes, from the epigastrium to the paraspinal or the spinal person behind." Yes. So that pain may mimic your pancreatitis, cholecystitis, and all the itis in the abdomen. But patients may have this on routine check. If they may tell you they have got epigastric pain, "Ikthe the duktai mala." That's how they come out with. So okay. that can be a normal finding in hyperemesis. Also, may not may not mean that you got something like which is more ominous below. Yes, sir. By the okay, way, Usha, what, what you said you mentioned Mallory Weiss. So what uh, 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 what uh, symptom uh, will you look for in Mallory Weiss? <laughs> now you put your foot very, into it. Now you're very wise. So wisefully answer Mallory uh, Weiss. So Mallory Weiss tears. So the patient has a tear which is limited to the mucosa. So if the bleeding and if the blood in the vomitus is quite fresh red colored and significant then we will have to proceed further with the help of a gastroenterologist so what history will guide you that this is a mallory weiss tear so the patient will have significant amount of blood in the vomitus fresh red colored it has to After... be significant if it's a small blood amount you won't think it's a mallory weiss so so <clears throat> meaning what so that on repeated episodes after vomiting and retching the patient is having blood in every vomitus good so the answer is that by and large okay it doesn't uh, you know in medicine there is no hard and fast rules but by and large the first vomit might be clear might be normal gastric contents and the second or the third vomit may contain the blood because the first vomit has caused the tear and that allowed only the stomach contents to come up and then in the subsequent vomits that mucosal tear is bleeding and that is allowing some blood to be mixed with the fresh blood to come up but it need not be substantial it can be but it need not be substantial even a small amount of blood should keep you wise on to the possibility okay 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 so it says it suppose as you said it's a substantial amount of blood then what is what is the condition you're going to think of <clears throat> then, then we have to rule out some mallory weiss tear or if no no that we just discussed no उंट Not uneasiness. There's a there's a there's a crazy amount of chest pain. Okay, that the patient is just not able to bear. It is one of the worst chest pains a patient can get because there's an actual rupture of the entire esophagus. Yes, so, sir. Very very significant. <clears throat> then the contents will leak into the mediastinum, into the pleural cavity, and then the presentations of mediastinitis, pleuritis, all that will sepsis, all that will follow. but that yes. the first patient will tell you that she has never had such a severe pain that is important okay okay sir right okay so so now you you see you got your patient this now what what are you next going to do for your patient this is your patient who has come 12 vomits not retaining anything lost weight what else So, so the first we will advise. Uh, so, the first we'll try to elevate the patient of her symptoms. We'll admit the patient. So, and then the management will be for one is to elevate the patient of her symptoms of constant not vomiting. Second is to cure her dehydration. Is to <coughs> is to keep a check because the patient is dehydrated and hence to balance the fluid and electrolytes. Sir, proceed with anti-emetics. 
keep the patient. So to, are you happy with this hemoglobin of ten point six, which you have shown us? So the ten. Point, sir, it's on the lower side, sir. But as of now, sir, I'm not worried about the hemoglobin 10.6, sir. So, do you think the hemoglobin, this patient is vomiting from how many days, you said? So, severe nausea and vomiting since one day, sir. No, no. Totally how many days? Sir, on and off since a matter of four weeks, sir. But initially... Uh, so, so, and you said the patient is 90 by 60. She is dehydrated. So obviously this patient is having a degree of hemoconcentration. So this is a falsely high hemoglobin. High hemoglobin. The actual hemoglobin is likely to be eight or something like that. So what is the hematocrit matters here then? No? What yeah. is the hematocrit? Exactly. So the MCV is 70, which is on the no, no, lower no. side. No, 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 no. Hematocrit. Hematocrit. Uh, hematocrit, sir, around 25 PCV. It's a slow one. Okay. So, yes, sir, it's low. Mm. Yes, it's so very she's anemic. She's anemic and along this hemoconcentration. So, this is a, not the right, uh, this thing, the reflection of the status. Anyway, so what else you did? You did uh, investigations, your TSS, serology, fasting, sugar. What else you would like to do in her? So, so these were the old reports which were available from her first okay. ANC visits, which okay, confirmed... Okay, okay, okay. Single life and so the fresh reports read as hemoglobin 10.5 WBC 11,000 platelets normal. So, but basically the electrolyte is deranged because the constant vomiting leads to hyponatremia, hypokalemia. So the sodium reads 130, potassium 3, and urine acetone 3 plus, sir. That's perhaps the good. So, so what did you do? What what was your next move move on this patient? Did the ECG show something? Do you have have you have, do you have the ECG to show us? Uh, sir, I don't have the ECG to show you, sir. But the ECG was normal, sir. Okay. No, you did you did investigation and you found ketone positive. Is there any clinical way of knowing that patient is into ketoacidosis? So the breath uh, will smell of acetone ketone, sir. What else? What is that called? What what breath is that called? It's called Kusmal's breath, okay? Kusmal's breath, yes, sir. Where else can you get that type of breath? Sir, in diabetic ketoacidosis, sir. Excellent. Okay. Wow. Good. So now what, what is your next step on this patient function? So, sir, we'll advise admission to the patient. We'll try to alleviate her of her symptoms. So, we'll, we'll start to hydrate her with IV fluids and start her on IV medications. Keep her nil by mouth for the next 24 hours. Now, how does this ketoacidosis differ from diabetic ketoacidosis? Uh, so, because here there is... Uh, so, because here the, uh, the patient has no oral intake of glucose or a basic... The patient is not able to tolerate any glucose. So, so th that's why there is fat breakdown, which leads to increase in ketones, so mainly increase in acetone. Mm. And in diabetic ketoacidosis? The body is not able to use the glucose which is available with the body because uh, of, because not able to use because the, the insulin is like, for example, in type 2, the body is resistant to insulin which is available in the body. And uh, so that's why there also there is fat breakdown. Fat breakdown happens in both. There and there. So, what is the difference sir is asking? Um, I don't know if Dr. Sanjeev Panna can help us out with the answer. No, I, I, I'm, I'm also, also I'm, waiting for Dr. Rajendra's answer. I'm ignorant on this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dr. Saragi, please sir, tell us please. what's in your mind. See, see, if you look at both the things, in this is one is called a starvation ketoacidosis. Because there is no glucose in the circulation, the fat is broken down. So it's a curb cycle which comes in picture. Curb is it cycle. clear? Yes, sir. So there is curb cycle or uh, what you call it as uh, resulting into acidosis. While in diabetic ketoacidosis, there is excessive glucose in the body. Yes, sir. As a result, there is uh, 
lactic acid formation. Yes, sir. So that's the basic difference between both of them. Okay, sir. Right. Yes. So ketones are there. Now, how will you proceed? Uh, so uh, we'll keep the patient nil by mouth because for the episodes yeah. of any oral intake will just aggravate the vomiting, yeah. and we will hydrate the patient. Now See you said the... hydrate. Hydrate means what will you give here? Uh, sir, we, the ideal fluid would be to start with one pint sodium NS. Why NS? There is already less of glucose in the body, no? So, yeah, but sir, uh, because of constant episodes of vomiting, maybe the patient would be low on her vitamin B1 and B6. And suddenly, if we push mm. sugar, it can precipitate vernikase. Yeah, very good. Very good. Yeah, vernikase yeah. encephalopathy. Yes, good, good one, Akanksha. I think yeah. that's what Dr. Uh, Sarogi, Sarogi was trying to find. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah. What, what do you do in that case? What do what, what you give her? Before you so, so much now you have given only saline and the potassium is already low. So, no, so, we'll add 10% KCL to that, sir, and we'll give it slowly over three hours. So, one NS with KCL. Why not give dextrose plus normal saline combination DNS? Uh, dextrose, sir, we will give dextrose, but sir, first we'll try to give her sodium. Uh, with... No, 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 no. What sir is asking is, why don't you start dextrose here? The patient is in ketosis. She's already having a caloric deficit. Why not give uh, you, one answer you said is that the thiamine uh, might, might get further lowered with, with glucose metabolism, which is right. But what is the other big reason which sir is asking you to, to point out? So, because the potassium might go further low, sir. Very good. Very good. Okay. When you give glucose, the whatever you are going to push up the insulin, the insulin is going to put the potassium intracellularly. So, there's going to be a further fall and the patient may land up with something very serious immediately in your, in your ward, which you never want to happen. Okay. Yes, so, what sir. can can be the worst effect which you can see in the ward of a potassium going down like that. So, potassium going down, so it can, uh, the pa uh, patient can have arrhythmia, sir. Right. So, what will the patient tell you? What is happening? What are you going to Pal see? The patient will complain of palpitations or uneasiness. The If the uh, hypokalemia becomes very severe, the patient can have ventricular arrhythmia, torsidus um, arrhythmia. So that will all come later on. The first, the patient is going to start feeling so weak that she is not going to move and she is going to get severe cramps, muscle weakness, cramps. Okay. And yes, the, the, she may get ileus because of paralytic ileus because of the abdominal distending. Okay. And the, the, yes, the, the, there may be weakness of the limbs. So that is what the patient and the relatives will tell you. Okay. So, you know that you have done something which is iatrogenic. So, that is what Dr. Saraugi was trying to point out that never start straight away with DNS. Always the first thing to give, which is the ideal solution you can give these patients, Akanksha. Ideal solution. Yes, which is the best IV fluid, which is. Where, where you will not have to think too much also. You know, you can give that and then it, it will work for every... All all the problems will get connected. It's not so, easy ring, to... Ringer lactate? No, no, no. You don't give Ringer. Why, what is the potassium content of Ringer? Uh, sir, it's less than the NS. NS, does it have potassium? Yeah. NS, normal saline. How much potassium does normal saline have? Now, don't get confused. We are talking of normal saline, okay? Huh, does, it yes, have, does it have potassium or it has no potassium? Sir, it does not have potassium, ah, sir. Exactly. So, where is the question of potassium? Yeah, it has only sodium and chloride. And How much does Ringer have? Um, so, that I don't know. So, a Ringer pint has just about 4 milliequivalents, which is very, very low. Yes, sir. Understand that the ringer point is hardly going to give you even 
there's just no use of trying to so the only there is only one solution which really is very specific and that is isolate g but that hardly most of the wards don't even have it so you have to order isolate g and that has a very good dose of potassium in it almost oh. 70 milliequivalent so that covers up for most of the time for when a patient is having a lot of potassium loss but okay. otherwise, otherwise you can just give normal saline with with casol as you said and that you have to be very careful that you don't infuse it fast. Okay? Yes. So what's the maximum amount of potassium you can give to a patient at a, at a say in an hour? Um, so in in one pint, how much potassium can you add? How many ampules? And how much sir, one, one ampule contains how many milli equivalents? Of, of sir, case? we can add one ampule of KCL, sir. Why don't you want to add more? So. Why can't you add more? Add more, no? Add two, add three. What is the problem? Give it slowly. Give it in three hours. So, but the concentration also changes, sir, when we add two, three KCL in one point. And then... Yeah, but you give it, instead of giving it in one hour, I'm saying add three ampules, give it in three hours. Is that okay? No, sir. The, uh, the weight by, the concentration increases, sir. Ah, so let it increase, no? But you're giving it very slowly. Anyway, you said you can give one ampule per hour, right? Sir, so, so no, one ampule in one pint tennis, we can give it over three to four, four hours. Suppose the patient's potassium was two. What would you do? This is three, so it's all right. You're still in dust on the border. Suppose it was two, what would you do? Manor, can the other students help her? Or no, we can... We don't, have, we don't have... I, I don't oh. know, Sukeshi has joined, she can join in. I don't know, Sukeshi seems to be here. Or oh, they can put it on the people. chat or something? Can they, can they yeah, answer? Chat, chat is on the other... They have the, the delegate link is on the other side. We have got no link. They should send the questions to... the. the we are, this is the first program with ClearNet. They are supposed to send the question there and they'll send it to us. But perhaps oh. that has not been primed today. Ah. We'll only have to give the answers because what we're going to do next time is make those questions go to the uh, the coordinator of ClearNet and they send it to one of us on our WhatsApp. So that okay. does not happen today. We are not able to coordinate that. Okay. So, so the we answer, will have to answer it now. The answer is simply uh, Akanksha that yes, if potassium is two, you don't fool around. You get this patient into ICU on a monitor. Okay. And on a central line, and then you can and you can have put a infusion pump and give the potassium slowly. Otherwise, this patient can get a very serious cardiac arrhythmia or a diaphragmatic weakness and land in a lot of problems. You get the okay. point. Yes, so sir. De you are dealing with a metabolic emergency. Hyperemesis is a metabolic emergency. You're not just handling just the gynec or ob gyn part of it. Yes, sir. Right. So you have to know how to and when. You may you may not. I, I, I was asking you a little too advanced thing. So that's all right if you didn't answer. But you must know when to shift the patient out from your ward to get into a ICU status. ICU care. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. If suppose the potassium was 3.5, what would you do? 3.5. So we would still give one NS with potassium slowly because. Would you like to? Would you like to keep it? Give some some form of oral potassium if you can control the vomiting well. So we can syrup for potassium, sir. Sorry, sorry. Come again. So yes, sir. We can give for potassium, low potassium. Yeah. With 3.5, if you can control vomiting well by means of pharmacotherapy, then you can go ahead and give oral potassium. And what, what is the best way of giving oral potassium? So, there are uh, syrup which comes or which have potassium. Right. Have you, have you ever tried to taste that syrup? <laughs> no, sir. Yes. Akanshi, give your coconut water vendors are around everywhere. Hello. <laughs> so, if you if even a person who's never vomited in his life is likely to vomit with that syrup. That's why you heard that, you know, chuckle from Dr. Motoni and Dr. Saraogi. 
So it's mm. a terribly tasting syrup. None of them have really been able to mask. Potassium chloride is terrible. So you gave coconut water, okay, as he said, and then as sir said, and how much, by the way, how much coconut water, how much potassium is there in one glass? It's a favorite Viva question, huh? you must know that. Um, so... so this I'm not sure of, so one glass. Hmm. So it's about eight to nine milliequivalents in one glass in 250 ml. Not so the, the study has been done by a very good Indian scientist called Roshan Patel. It came in the my biomedical research paper 2018, where he said that one liter contains 37 milliequivalents. So that's not really too much. Okay. But at okay. least it's a very pleasant way of taking it. What other what other day-to-day day-to-day uh, food can you give? Don't say tomatoes nowadays. Tell me something simpler. Uh, so banana. Yes, very good. So one banana, one medium-sized banana is 12 milliequivalents. Okay. So which is again good. And But provided you can get the, the patient to stop vomiting. Stop so now, vomiting. Yes, very good. Any other, any other patient where you'll be excessively careful about the potassium? The answer is that if a patient is diabetic, you have yes, to be, uh, if a patient has had a cardiac issue, a patient is on a diuretic like Lasix, a patient has a chronic liver disease, these patients, you must keep the potassium up because they can have, you know, serious problems due to hypokalemia. Okay, okay. A yes. patient can end up in serious arrhythmias. Uh, a patient with liver disease can land up with hepatic encephalopathy. A patient on Lasix anyway has low potassium, so you must supplement that and get it up. Okay? Okay. Yes, sir. So let's okay. start moving. Akanksha just got 10 more minutes. Let's go. What yeah. next? Come on. You've done this. You've started on NS with Kisol. That's Potasol. And you move ahead now. So, uh, after management. So, yeah. uh, yes, sir. So, so basically, we, we spoke about the part about taking care of the electrolyte imbalance of the patient. Or second, we'll talk about is to decrease the symptoms of vomiting, where mm. all the problems arise from. So, so we can, uh, we'll start with IV mm. anti-emetic, sir. Mm. First line drug. First line, sir, sir, antihistaminic H1 receptor blocker, sir, we can go with, uh, or we can go with phenothiazine class of drugs. So, sir, for Which example, yeah, go ahead. promethazine, sir. Okay. Promethazine. How, how much do you give? Sir, 10 milligram we can give, sir, thrice a day. Orally? No, sir, IV. 10 milligrams. The ampule is 25 milligram per ml, so that's 50 milligram in 2 ml. I how think. much are you going to give? What, half cc? No, no, no. Uh, yes, sir. 25, sorry. 25. We can give, sir, till TDS, we can give 25. So, 25 milligrams intramuscular eta ali. Yes, sir. Okay. Why are you so afraid about using Ondan Cetra? So, Ondan Cetra, sir, we are not scared of using, sir, but uh, there has not been like enough study. So, some say that it, initially it was Let thought... me be honest, Akanksha, with you, every gynecologist in the city of Mumbai or in the country is first yes. line drug is ondansetron. Let's not talk about papers of abnormalities. A lot of years have passed by. We have hardly seen any increase. So it is the drug. Even if they say that it has got probably everybody is using that drug is only ondansetron. Yes, so practically sir. speaking, we are talking about books now, first level, second level, third level. But believe me, I have had situations where none of them work. Phenargan doesn't work. Metocroplan doesn't work. Ondansetron doesn't work. Just doesn't work. That's it. And they keep on puking. So we are really at a weird sense. Okay. In case you want to give Phenargan, you're getting 25 milligram. It patient is still vomiting. Come on, go ahead. What, what next? So, so the second line we can choose metoclopramide. How much? Uh, so 10 milligram. Six so hourly. Add, you add on to it. Sorry, sir. You add on to meter, uh, you add on to uh, this thing, uh, promethazine. No. no. Uh, Yes, sir. We can give after promethazine. If it does not settle, sir, we can give metoclopramide. So, we can give metoclopramide plus pro promethazine at the same time. No. Correct? No. <laughs> then, get me. Sir, the 
What is what is the usual regimen you follow, Manor, in your in your practice? I start with onion center on right away. I, I give them our even following that I give them pantoprazole at the same time and phenargan I put in the drip. Great. So that's, that's eight, a, eight, I give eight milligrams, six kali to eight kali of that and give them phenargan because they sleep well also with phenargan. And that is promethazine. And only if it doesn't work, then only I add me to club. So some of them still don't respond. I don't know why. So what some of what? Them, what Dr. Mutwani is saying is very important that you start with a phenothiazine and then come on. So don't start with another phenothiazine, which is also very easily available and in the ward, and that is stematin. Okay. Stematin, yes. Sir. yes. What will happen if you have given the patient stematin and now you've given metoclopramide after that? What can happen to your Increased patient? Increased chances of extra pyramidal. Ah, right. right. So, what, what will the patient present with? What will happen to your patient? So, the patient can have complaints of uh, disbalanced gait, uneasiness, uh, and on examination, we can find ataxia. Uh, we can find so the patient. The patient is vomiting like crazy. She's high, ninety by sixty. <laughs> She's not going to get up and walk. <laughs> what Something is going to happen? face? There's Something some crisis in on the face. Oculogyric crisis, sir. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So what, what will you see in that? What will happen to the face? Um, so nystagmus will be there. No, no, no. no. Thing of Before, five balls. It's it's one of the most frightening things for the relatives. They will come running to you, pull you out of your chamber and tell you that patient ko fit a gaya. Okay? Huh. And, ah, and the, 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 so the, the eyeballs... eyes will turn one way, the jaw will turn the other way, the tongue yes, will turn. There'll be all sorts of things. So be careful, okay? So don't start with stematil. That's the thing. Because stematil is very easily available as a mouth dissolving thing. And, you know, so many patients have taken it at home. And then you give perinom in the ward or metoclopramide, sorry, in the ward. And then you can ask for trouble. Which patient specially is very likely to get an extra pyramidal reaction? How will you how will you smell this patient out? Okay, let's be careful. Let's not give her the medication. Sir, if they are on some antipsychotic, sir. So that we have discussed because the 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 side effect is additive. But before uh, more than that, if you have a thin, lean patient, they are very prone to this. So be very careful. Okay, you have a nice, strong, well built patient. They may not have a problem with a thin undernourished patients very high chance of getting this all right go ahead what when you're giving iv fluids what are the things you're looking for in the patient what else is likely to happen uh, so sorry sir i did not get this. what 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 how are you going to judge improvement apart from the symptoms what else simple parameters to judge improvement your patient is improving how are you going to say that so the signs of dehydration on a general examination will look that the patient is looking better. Like the patient, the tongue does not look dehydrated anymore. The eyes are not sunken. The skin tugger is maintained. The tachycardia before, has settled before down. Before that, before that. The patient has to pass urine. Okay. Oh, yes, Be sir. Very careful. Yes. The patient's urine output is your most important thing here. The patient is not passing or the urine output is poor. Keep a very close intake output chart. All right. Manohar, anything else you want to ask her? Next, yes. he's asking, sir is asking you for the final Brahmastra, which you, you can use when nothing is working. So then okay. we can go for, for intractable cases of vomiting, so we can add steroids. Excellent. So what steroids, how much? How much sir, steroids? Sir, sir, and also one more thing, so when we give fluids to the patient, it is also important that we add theamine, 100 mg. So that there is no precipitation. That you said. You said ah, that. And so hydrocortisone we can give. So hydrocortisone we can give 100 milligram. BD. Okay. At least BID. Minimum. If, <coughs> if what? How many? Sorry. Sorry, sir. If it still doesn't work. Still does not work. Um. So then we we have to switch to enteric or parenteric means of continuous nutrition to the patient. What will you do? There are two things. One is either you pass a RALS tube and do parenteral feeding 
and yes, second sir. to rule out other causes hmm. oh, yes sir pregnancy yes sir is there any role of mtp in a case of hyperemesis gravidarum uh, so yes sir that, that, that is like the last resort where where termination of pregnancy is like the last resort sir do you think so so i have never seen that termination in for hyperemesis manor i don't think so no i have i have done one sir recently is it first pregnancy similar scenario is to get admitted every 2 weeks uncontrollable vomiting every possible antiemetic given goes home puts on that continues to vomit can't we somehow managed to go through that pregnancy second pregnancy started vomiting from the sixth week of pregnancy went on on and all same old used again every possible admitted it everything counseled her spoke to her she gave up and says doc i'm not going to live like this get this for over 10 11 weeks i bought it her imagine she says and it was just a perfect replica what happened in the first pregnancy i mean everything under the sun i've tried for her i just had nothing left i really gave up that was one case i've had in my entire life i've done recently i've done it so i know it's and okay. she used to literally be in such a shambles like you know whatever you give her and there she pukes out if we did everything her ultrasound or electrolyte everything everything was done to rule out any other pathology nothing was there and after the thing she was all smiling she came in after two blood doc i'm great i'm fine i'm beautiful i mean post after evacuation she was absolutely perfect within a week i don't know i mean i was literally helpless that this helpless is the true word to use because i just stand up no thing to where to look at in yeah. fact i even even used when she was on oral the even the spiridoxin on her 100 mg a day in divided doses which we use in small batches of you know 10 mg 20 mg of doxylamine in earlier days even that didn't work then of course she was on round the clock on all the antiemetics parenteral we took lost okay. lost the deposit anyway go ahead please so what are the oral favorite oral antiemetic drugs sir or oh, favorite oral antiemetic drugs are doxylamine sir with uh, with pyridoxine yeah please yeah sir doxylamine yeah. with pyridoxin sir okay how do you normally give it uh, is there sir, a trick to it yes sir so we can give one early in the morning one in the afternoon and two tablets in the night sir yeah sometimes if people give one in the morning and two at night because the morning sickness is so severe they say that we give it at two at night two in the night sir yeah so one in the morning two in the night that's what but that also is really okay for mild cases sometimes it doesn't also, the antiemetics have to be given prior to eating something maybe yeah, one, one, and half, one and a half hours before generally they have a habit of taking something after food and then they vomit out the drug also so that history is equally important okay sir when metoclopramide is supposed to be a safe drug from pregnancy point of view i mean it's been an age old brand and parenterally people are little afraid because of the extra pyramidal nonsense which can happen because it was a pre operative medication when i was uh, in my residency days you know we didn't have andron cetron those days so pre operative perinomatropine was always given to patients and we never saw so many oculogyric or anything of that kind but it is a great drug to use i don't think there's anything for us to be very it's an old medicine but it's an excellent medicine perinom tablets are available and metoclor tablets are available in the market are, are penargan available as oral form yes sir available sir yes sir promethazine yes sir available in oral oral form sir yes sir what is the role of your h2 receptor antagonist like uh, omeprazole and pantoprazole and ranitidine and all that so basically there is gastric slowing during pregnancy so delayed gastric emptying the sphincters dilate so there is a, a additional factor of reflux which is associated so sir it's always good to add uh, iv pantoprazole in a case of hyperemesis agree with you yeah yes sir main hi banaunga theek hai okay anything else sir on hyperemesis no i don't think so it's enough i think we'll ask uh, um, sanjeev has to start with the stock on gi disorders in pregnancy uh, he's becoming thank you sir you thank did you. very well i think you you are well versed with medicine you are with holy spirit hospital are you 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, no doubt, you must be getting some range of patients around you involving medicine and also. Yes, Thank you, sir. Anyway, do me a favor since you're with Holy Spirit, get more students to join us because I know the gynec department is highly enriched out there with Dr. Susan Sorter's heading it. So yes, I think you can ask them, give them the link also because now we'll be here for quite some time with uh, the clarinet people. So yes, Dr. Sanjeev, we are back to you now. I think uh, right. let's say for the finale of the day and here we have Dr. Sanjeev Khanna, a very well-known senior gastroenterologist and uh, who's affiliated to a lot of hospitals. His clinical acumen is impeccable. He's a man who believes in his hands, his skills rather than a laboratory parameters as much. And uh, what better uh, he, he believes in one great religion which all of us must believe is friendship and he has never let his friends down and today incidentally Sanjeev today's friendship day <laughs> so <laughs> yes. happy friendship day to all my friends out there on the platform and well on to you regarding uh, the talk on GI disorders in pregnancy a topic which most of us OBGYN people put it under the carpet you know chalta and we give standard medication so let's change that thinking <laughs> So let's go for it, please. Thank you. I think I'll have to share slides after she. You'll you'll have to take away your. Akansha, please stop screen share. <coughs> yeah, she's done it. Yeah. So, uh, am I am I yeah, yeah. visible? All right. Loud and clear. Right, right. So, um, you know, I, I'm reminded of this very famous uh, quote, which uh, was made. It's attributed to a number of people, and one of them it's attributed to is Sir Richard Burton, but I'm not sure. But the quote is that on when when uh, Richard Burton went through um, you know his marriage with Liz Taylor, and then divorced and then Liz Taylor went through another many number of marriages and then they remarried and on his wedding night he says, said this that I know what I'm supposed to do tonight the problem is how to make it interesting so <clears throat> I'm, I know that I'm I'm speaking to you know the, the topmost gynex of the city who are so well versed with this problem I get called for it very occasionally Manohar so whenever you all come into, you need something like that. And therefore, I'm, I'm, it's like taking uh, coals to Newcastle. A lot of you are far more experienced in this. So we know that nausea and vomiting in pregnancy is, is a regular problem. Almost 70% pregnant women have nausea. More than 40% have vomiting. And if it's severe, which is about 1% of one per 1,000 pregnancies, you call it hyperemesis. The pre-concurrence, as, as we discussed, is around eight weeks. It starts in the fourth or six weeks. And usually by 20 weeks, most of them have settled. <clears throat> so nausea, we know, is almost 85% nausea NVP. And the symptoms then, then start settling after the 12th week. The majority subside by the 16th week. But in about 15%, they continue beyond and 10% will continue to even suffer later on in pregnancy. Sorry about that. So, uh, what Dr. Saragi was asking that, you know, hyperemesis is diagnosed when we have a triad of more than 5% pre-pregnancy weight loss, dehydration with electrolyte imbalance. And in this, most of my, most of my references are from uh, William's textbook. And uh, so that, that's something which all of you read and um, it's, it's, uh, they're all there. And in, in this survey of a large number of people, at least one, uh, a significant number had one termination due to hyperemesis and 6.1% had multiple terminations, which you were talking about, Manohar. So it's, it's not that simple. Um, so they could, they could have a problem to the mother and they have this fear that the baby could die or the baby is abnormal. So many patients sometimes have asked for termination, but this is more outside, abroad. Etiology, as Dr. Saragi was asking, is HCG and progesterone, which is the main thing. There, there are talks about 
changes in gastrointestinal motility in the stomach, especially because of um, uh, progesterone and HCG again. There's immune system dysregulation. And interestingly, H. pylori infection has been found to be commoner in patients with this. But somehow this is something which doesn't strike a chord with me because H. pylori is rampant in our country and especially in our city. Almost 70% according to one survey have it. So I don't think we can, you know, when there are two things which occur commonly, pregnancy is common and H. pylori is common. I don't think we can just summate the two and say that it is due to that. And often um, coexistence is not equal to causality. We know that. So the onset if is, is usually in the first trimester. And if it is later on, especially after 10 or even later weeks, it, it uh, will need to look out for other causes. And about 10%, it will persist beyond 20 weeks. I'm not able to, okay. <clears throat> we, we discussed this, that there can be complications like Wernicke encephalopathy. So Wernicke's encephalopathy, the patient will present with blurring of vision, confusion, memory loss, drowsiness. And on examination, there could be nystagmus or, or squint coming on and difficulty in walking and ataxia. Uh, very rarely, there can be severe abdominal or epigastric pain. And uh, you, you might get abnormal amylase levels, but these are often due to um, salivary amylase, which is high and may not, need not be due to pancreatitis, but you'll have to keep that in mind. Uh, esophageal rupture or Mallory Weiss or even more than that, Borhavs is, is known. Mallory Weiss is a superficial tear. Borhavs is a through and through tear of the, of the esophagus. And uh, of course, um, you know, there's a much higher degree of depression and anxiety scale scores in women with uh, NVP and NG. I don't know why my slides are not moving. Okay. So the dietary measures are here for you and uh, that's which all of us, you know, and that there, there should be small frequent meals, the diet avoids spicy food, emotional support should be offered by a medical professional and, and in the worst cases, psychotherapy. Uh, ginger has been traditionally used and ginger capsules are now available. Somehow I've not found the mainstream uh, pharma companies making them, but uh, many of the smaller companies seem to make them. Thymine supplementation should be given, especially if you're giving dextrose. Uh, pyridoxin is, is, uh, is very important because many of these patients have pyridoxin deficiency <clears throat> and um, uh, supplementing that makes a lot of difference. So we always give uh, pyridoxin to these patients and we know that most of the vitamins are factors which are central to life <clears throat> and pyridoxin takes, takes part in a lot of biochemical reactions in the Krebs cycle, in the overall physiology. So it's, it's an extremely vital um, and a very simple way of, of getting patients out of a problem. So if they can tolerate this, <clears throat> very interestingly, you should know that Benedictine, which was first came in way, way back in the 50s, was banned in the 60s in the US because they thought that it might uh, you know, have a uh, teratogenic effect. But that is not... And then it, it was disproven and then Benedictine came back and cyclages and other things. And in our country, it's available in so many brand names. So then you can see the list of drugs. The next, the best ones are the combination of doxylamine, pyridoxine. And of course, you can go on to the metoclopramides and promethazine. Uh, next, pyridoxine and doxylamine are category A drugs. So they're very safe. Metoclopramide, promethazine are all category B and C, but uh, you need to watch out for side effects and don't use them in, as I said, in the very thin built patients. Be careful of them. This is the puke index, which is you, which I don't think um, most of us use, but it's useful. 
to categorize a patient, especially who's admitted, and to decide whether he's moderate, she's moderate, or mild or severe. And depending on the on the number of vomits and in the what has happened in the last 24 hours, etc. <clears throat> Hyperemesis we've discussed can happen out of the vomiting patients who have NVP. Uh, a few will land up with serious problems, and then they can get all this. They they will have they'll be dehydrated. They'll be muscle wasting. Uh, you know, weight loss, electrolyte imbalance, ketonuria, more than five percent of body weight loss, and they can also have serious uh, electrolyte imbalances, which need to be looked into. So we've discussed this already, so I won't spend too much time on this. Normal saline can be used. That's the best thing. And the, you must take watch out for um, uh, the, the complications which can occur in this patient. Don't correct the sodium very rapidly because you can get a problem in the pons, which is called central pontine myelinolysis. Potassium, we've already discussed. Be very careful with potassium infusions. Not more than... Uh, about 20 milliequivalents in the first two to three hours and usually not more than 100 to 200 milliequivalents in a day. Okay, And then if, if, the, if the levels are very low, then it's always better to do it under central, um, un, under ICU care and monitoring. So initial management should have all these factors taken into account and not to let a serious patient languish in the ward when the patient's likelihood of getting a cardiac or a neurological issue remains high. There is some problem with the movement of the slide. Can Ambika help me out on this? Sir, uh, just click on the slide that you are presently on. And yeah. uh, at the bottom, sir, you will find arrow options coming. Hmm. Are you able to see it, sir? Yeah, but it's not, I can't see any arrow option. Yeah. Huh. Now I can see the slides. But... Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so small for gestational age babies and significant low birth weight babies are known in patients with hyperemesis gravidarum and these are the lines of treatment which we've already discussed so i won't go into them condensetron seems to be the the prime drug which is being used by all that with metoclopramide once the basic uh, H1 uh, antihistaminics and the, the phenothiazines have not worked. Steroids I've used very rarely, but um, before I would, uh, you know, just give up on this patient, I would say that uh, uh, I would try, um, you know, there, there have been case reports of patients who have had a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. And through that, you can put a jejunostomy tube, which is fairly non-invasive. Endoscopies can be done very easily in patients with the uh, with the um, uh, pregnancy nowadays, so there is no issue on that, and it should work. So coming to the next thing, which is GERD, we know that gastroesophageal reflux is also common. There is substantial discomfort, radiation of pain, burning in the chest, and worsening by meals and recumbency, and better with so we know that GERD is defined as chronic symptoms of mucosal damage produced by abnormal reflux or gastric contents. The classic symptom is what is called postural pyrosis. Patient takes a meal, lies down and says that sometimes the meal walks into the mouth or there is retrosternal burning. When she sits up, she's often better. If she takes smaller meals, she's often better. <clears throat> Again, it usually starts towards the end of the second trimester. And that is why the question that if, if uh, hyper or nausea NVP persists, always think of additional GERD, which is 
causing a problem. In addition, these patients may have micro aspirations into the lung and they may present with cough and wheezing, which is very common. Many of them present with ENT symptoms, recurrent throat pain, recurrent hoarseness of voice, and these are all these are all part of GERD. So you can see that as the uterus enlarges, the stomach is compressed, the intra-abdominal pressure rises, and the resting lower esophageal sphincter pressure decreases. And this changes the gradient, and that is why. So you can see that the pathogenesis of GERD involves a lot of different, different uh, elements. And one important one is what is written on the right upper side, what is called transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. So everyone has some degree of reflux normally. When you have a big heavy meal, you tend to burp a little, which is part of physiological reflux. But when the when the symptoms come and, and when, when uh, there is retrosternal discomfort, which stays on, then you know that you're having a pathological illness. This is a very good diagrammatic representation of a hiatal hernia, which tends to get worsened because of abdominal pressure by the gravid uterus, especially in the later stages of pregnancy. This is what's called the endoscopic appearance or classification of GERD, the Los Angeles classification, starting with grade A, which is the mildest, to grade D, where you can see that there is a stricture formation and severe ulceration of the lower esophageal center, of the lower esophagus. <clears throat> what are the treatment options? The first thing is lifestyle modification, antacids, <coughs> H2 receptor antagonists, prokinetic agents, proton, proton pump inhibitors, and lastly, anti-reflux or endoscopic treatment. So the most important among all this, <clears throat> which we should insist on our patients, is not to lie down for three hours post-prandially. Sleep on the left side, elevate the head end of the bed by six inches, reduce fat intake, especially in, at the night time. It goes without saying that smoking should be stopped and excessive weight gain should not occur. Okay, not weight loss. So weight loss in, in pregnancy, it's a different thing. So Weight gain is part of pregnancy, but it should not be excessive. Our, our, especially the North Indian uh, patients tend to overeat ghee and uh, fatty foods and think that it's very good for the growing baby. And you have to warn them against that. So large meals, triggered foods, you should avoid. So we all like our patients to look like this. Most of the time, we will get patients who look like this. And many of us also start looking like this over a period of time. So you must see that these culprit foods, the caffeines, the nicotines, the peppermint, the worst thing which can be done is taking uh, chocolate with mint, which is, which is a known thing, citrus fruits, alcohol, and, and a lot of, uh, especially meat containing diet can also worsen the, because of the fat content. So lifestyle modifications we have discussed, liquid antacids, nowadays we are getting this uh, uh, liquid antacids which contain sodium alginate which works like a you know physical barrier to reflux and which is fairly safe in pregnancy and we have been using that with good effect so two teaspoons after a meal are usually the best way so a one-off reflux can be treated with this the patients who don't respond you can go on to the other drugs like proton pump inhibitors or or uh, h2 blockers most of us would favor the proton pump inhibitors, which are far more uh, effective. And all of them work, but omeprazole is category C and therefore should be avoided. It's the older agent. And among the newer agents, um, esomeprazole seems to be more, find more favor for patients with reflux. So esomeprazole is the better drug to use and uh, uh, better than and omeprazole should be avoided. So usually the important thing is to give it in the right way. And most of us don't do that or our patients don't take it. So you should instruct and write this down that the esomeprazole is available as a 40 milligram tablet and it should be taken half an hour before breakfast minimum. So half an hour before breakfast and in an occasional patient who has very severe reflux, you can give it half an hour before dinner also. So twice a day and as soon as you find the patient is better, uh, taper it down to once a day and then taper it down to the uh, most effective and the least uh, uh, smallest dose. 
The other very vexing problem one sees in pregnancy is constipation, and it can be terrible. This is the the what is called the Rome criterion or the American College of Gastroenterology definition of of constipation, which is very technical. So this is Rome three now. Rome four has come, which which is just makes it six months, and there is the the symptoms need not be just uh, the the frequency of stools which we are all used to looking at it means that there is straining there is a hard stool there is a sensation of incomplete evacuation there is sensation of anorectal blockage many patients will use manual maneuvers which they may not tell you like putting their finger into the rectum or even into the vagina to push the stool down and the and there are less than 3 stools per week and these are the these are important uh, criteria you need not have all of them if you have two or more of them that's all you need to make a diagnosis so straining hard stools incomplete evacuation manual maneuvers or less than three movements per week if you have two or more of the following you are dealing with a patient with with severe constipation chronic constipation it affects women far more than men and it it uh, is more as you age you can see that constipation has been there with us over the millennia this is an ad which i picked out from the new york times of 1908 where you can see that they are talking of cascara in the in candy and they, they in these countries western countries you you find um, chocolate candy and so many gummies with laxatives available so it's it's uh, vilified to such a big extent the the symptom of constipation that and the, you can see that this is a man who on the way to work he is suited booted enters a massage parlor and goes through a machine which which takes uh, certain you know wheels all over his abdomen to massage the stool out and this is again from that same old paper so constipation is a, affects about half women at some time during their pregnancy and the, our problem is not just that that it causes a problem with the quality of life it causes hemorrhoids it can worsen hernia it can produce a fissure it can produce bleeding and you can see that it's scattered throughout all the trimesters of pregnancy and it sometimes persists postpartum also what are the causes same thing progesterone decreased levels of motilin decreased levels of relaxin of course less physical activity and you know poor diet low water intake lack of fiber one very important thing we must look out for is patients who may be taking a dose of iron which sometimes worsen them or a lot of calcium which can worsen so iron and calcium you must keep a watch on and of course there are preparations of iron available nowadays with uh, docusate which uh, do not cause constipation so again the large uterus and all this but in unrelenting con constipation there is we have gone ahead and done endoscopies colonoscopies also to try and see they are fairly safe during pregnancy so the important tests to be done in every patient are the the tsh the serum calcium the serum potassium and the blood sugar apart from the other routine tests so don't miss out the metabolic causes of constipation and these are very easily treatable so you keep giving a laxative and the patient has a tsh of 25 she is not going to respond you have to get that in con, un, under control for us so what can happen <clears throat> if if uh, you know you don't get constipation apart from the quality of life you can get a utero vaginal um, prolapse the defecation straining can damage the pudendal nerve and impair the pelvic floor musculature and the cesarean section rate is higher in patients with uh, constipation almost to the tune of 2 thirds of patient compared to just around 1/4 in the other patients can you help me out with this ambika again dr khanna i wanted to know why cesarean section rate is high i don't know dr saraogi you have to tell me that but it is possibly the, the, this is some, again which we picked up you can see the reference down there it's from clinical gastroenterology 
and uh, this is a very interesting paper which they have mentioned possibly it's again related to some sort of you know uterine um, muscular muscle problem which can be part and parcel of the bowel problems okay mm. So we'll discuss this on the next slide. Right, just doesn't seem to move a function. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm stuck with the. Okay, so the management is uh, simple. <clears throat> Apart from the diet and lifestyle uh, modifications, we're telling them to have increased dietary fiber. Very often, we just tell the patient, "Jada salad khao, jada fruit khao," without explaining that to them. So we the the uh, exact direction should be given what type of food and usually patients who have when we make them take insoluble fiber like what is found in root vegetables that seems to help the most and certain foods which can sometimes you know paradoxically even constipate like pomegranates should be avoided in these patients uh, the the fiber what about can, sorry what about bananas? Banana, that's a very interesting point. Bananas can be given, but bananas, usually the overripe ones contain much, a lot of pectin. So they can paradoxically again constipate. So we can see that the laxatives are written and uh, we can see the safe ones are on the left upper side, which is lactulose or macrogol, which is a type of polyethylene glycol. Glycerine can be used as suppositories and bulking agents, which are like you know, isabgula husk or xylem can be used. Uh, what should not be used is castor oil and uh, bisacodyl should be given with, with caution because it can create pain and cramp. But castor oil is a definite no-no. Saline osmotic laxatives like milk of magnesia can be tried in the resistant cases. Senna can be given. I've used Senna for very short periods, sometimes in very difficult cases. I recently had a case of fecal impaction in the first in in the in the second trimester, where we used um, a combination of polyethylene glycol and local agents uh, suppositories, and the patient came out with that. Mineral oil, castor oil, are a no-no. Lactulose seems to be the most favored one. I won't go through this because it's already a little late. I'll try and skip that. So these are the laxatives which have been put up in front of you and we've been through them. Polyethylene glycol seems to be a very safe and a very, very effective uh, uh, laxative and is available as, uh, as liquids where you can dissolve 25 ml of the liquid in 100 ml of water and give it at night. Docusate is, is a weak drug. I have not found it working very well. Phenophthalene, Bisacodyl have written just so that they should not be given. Castor oil should not be given and the other should not be given. So the best seems to be lactulose overall, but the problem with lactulose is that it is one, patients find it too sweet. It, uh, it, it causes a bit of flatulence in some people and um, it, is, it is certainly an expensive uh, drug. Uh, it is good to tell your patients, especially who have a little high blood sugar, that their sugars will not go up with uh, lactulose because it's a non-absorbable drug and uh, non-absorbable sugar. And the other advantage is that it has a very good prebiotic effect. So it seems to help in that way also. 
for gut health. So the recommendations by Foxy and TOG are for lactulose as the first line drug. Of course, it's not a very powerful drug. It's a weaker drug and therefore uh, it one may often have to, in a, in a resistant case, have to fall back to other drugs. So its, it's action is slow. It's, it causes sometimes nausea, flatulence, but it's a good drug overall. Also in, in patients who have had anal sphincter injury in the postpartum phase or who have had perineal tears, it's better to give it for a few days to maintain a soft and easy stool. And we know that we start usually with half to one ounce of, of uh, the drug at night, and then you can increase it. Nowadays, you're getting due, uh, lactulose gummies also by one of the leading brands. So they can be given twice or thrice a day. What are the problems? They can have hernia, fecal impaction, fissure, hemorrhoids, bleeding. So all this has to be managed concomitantly. So... In summary, it's a good drug and usually well tolerated and we give it to across the board. We can even give it to the infants. These are the various classifications. They are there in all drugs and it's best to stick to the A and B group of drugs. We occasionally use category C drugs. Of course, I'm told that nowadays this classification is coming under a little cloud and uh, many times it, it uh, one goes more by what is called GRAS, generally regarded as safe. And as Dr. Motwani said, in, in by experience, you know, like as it applies to online section. And finally, coming to acute abdomen during pregnancy, the, the standard causes, you know, still exist acute appendicitis, ruptured ectopics, tubo ovarian pathologies, complications of ovarian cysts, torsion, rupture, hemorrhage, and gallbladder disease. These are all as common as the normal per, uh, population. And gallbladder diseases are to some extent more common. Appendicitis, almost one in 1500 pregnancies. And we have to be careful because the location of the pain is changes. We have to be careful in uh, you know having a high index of suspicion and picking that up. And the diagnosis is by again right low quadrant pain. Of course, the classic presentation: upper abdominal pain, migrating to the right lower abdomen, nausea, and mild fever and other symptoms. Graded compression, USG has, happens to be the best, but sometimes you may not be able to do that, especially in advanced pregnancy, and you may not get a proper diagnosis. So uh, people have fallen back on MRI, and I discussed it with some of the leading radiologists, and they said that even CT scan in the later trimesters, uh, which, which is carefully done and just gives, if, if you have a well done CT scan can be done with two grays of radiation, and it is good. So the GI drugs in pregnancy, we know these categories. A is the best. B is no effect on fetus, but only from animal studies. C is still drugs can be which can be useful, although there are not many studies. And D and X are not to be used. <clears throat> so that's the list of drugs for us. And you can see that omeprazole falls into category C. Most of the other GI drugs are category B and can be used. And uh, these are the drugs for uh, inflammatory bowel disease, which can be still used and Many of us use them fairly regularly in patients who are pregnant and, and have uh, either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. So there is no problem in using these drugs. So this is the summary of drugs for each of the conditions and they are put up for you. All of us know them. So I've, we already discussed them. And thank you very much for uh, patient hearing. And lastly, uh, just two quotes, one from my favorite actor, Clint Eastwood, who says, Marriage, marriages are made in heaven, but so are thunder and lightning. And from 
Dr. Joyce Brothers, who is a stand-up comedian and a psychotherapist in the U.S., that my husband and I have never considered divorce. Marriage sometimes, but never divorce. <laughs> Mur murder sometimes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that, that's the lighter side for the... What a way to finish up, Dr. Sanjay. Fantastic. A simple that's topics, okay. but they carry so much of weight because every alternate patient has got one of these two things happening in obstetrics. And all the misconceptions should be cleared because we take it very lightly, not really. It's an empirical thing. You know, we have made a standard protocol. Yoga, ek do teen char, ek do teen char. We never give it a thought, most of the observations. So this really gives them food for thought that what we must and what we should not. And let's not take every nausea vomiting as uh, having vomiting in pregnancy because you may have an underlying pathology. Keep your eyes, ears, everything open. And in case of any doubt, you can always refer and get your opinions uh, from people. Anyway, thank you so very much, Sir Sanjeev, for such a um, for spending your time with us. In fact, two and a half, three hours of a Sunday morning with your busy schedule, even on Sundays, I know that. Thank you so very much. Your love for the students is uh, something we've always seen. We'll be catching you up a little later in the in the year for hepatitis and the liver disorders also. So thank you sure. so very much for that, Dr. Saragi, sir. I don't know how to thank you enough. Please go ahead. Yeah. I have a question for Sanjeev. Does yes, the sir. toilet matter, Indian toilet and Western toilet? Excellent question. You know, uh, we, we are we have now we are finding that the Indian toilet where the pelvis actually tilts forward and you sit yeah. and straightens out the anorectal angle. There's an anorectal angle which is formed right down there <clears throat> because of the puborectal is sling going around the at the anorectal angle. So the puborectal starts from the symphysis pubis and goes backwards towards the sac sacrum and hinges the anorectal angle forward and that has to relax. So when you sit in the Indian toilet, it is much better and more physiological. But advanced pregnancy, I don't think many people will be, you know, with this current uh, generation may be able to do that. So we have a way out for that, Dr. Saragi, which is called the squatty potty which is nothing but a very simple small stool which is placed under the feet of the patient so that the, the knees get elevated to some extent and you're sitting on a western toilet but you're, you're mimicking to some extent the Indian toilet. Good idea. Yeah. So it's available on Amazon and off online. Uh, it's called the Squatty Potty. Good. Thanks a lot, Sanjeev, for spending time on a Sunday morning. Yeah, we, enjoyed, uh, we enjoyed thoroughly. Yeah, I really um, look forward to meeting all of you and I remember our great days at Cooper when we used Cooper, to sit. I know. I know. <laughs> have our cup of tea together. And, uh, Manohar and Karthik and Mohan, old, old friends from KEM and, and all the group. So thanks, thanks for your invitation. Thank you. I really Thank enjoyed. You so much. Thank you once again. Honor and privilege to be. And with friends you. and all the students out there and the consultants who have joined in. I hope you've enjoyed this morning. We tried our best to make it, give it the shape it has taken. We hope it has gone through well and you have taken something back home. And I cannot uh, close before I thank the the ClearNet people. They've done a fab job. We'll make some a few changes and we'll discuss it on the group. But otherwise, it's been overall a fantastic uh, association with you for the last almost three and a half hours. So, Ritu Parna and Ambika, thank you so very much. And uh, thank you all the delegates and those people out there for making it possible and attending on a Sunday morning. So, now it's time. We have time enough for lunch. You want to say anything there, Ritu Parna? Yes, sure, sir. Please. Do uh, that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for uh, giving us this opportunity to host the session. It was really insightful and interactive. And I hope you had a seamless experience. Uh, so, sir, with all your due permissions, then uh, I'm closing the session for today and looking forward so, to hosting. Really so nice. Soon. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great lunch. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. <clears throat>